live you're we're going live now so it'll say we're going live they said hold on one second oh now i'm going to do the same thing that you guys all did and we're going to have to do a display setting screen swap and there we go so let's get everybody in the room and get this party started. Welcome everybody. We are now streaming live on Facebook where I am happy to report the, um, the oh God, the, the teletype is working as well. So we're getting the verbal and the audio on Facebook right now. So that's a good thing and we are good to go. So we're gonna let everybody enter the room and get populated. We've already got a number of people joining us on Facebook. If you are joining on Facebook, it is 6 p.m. Eastern time on July 13th, 2022. If you're listening to this live, you will have the opportunity to watch the entire session live on Facebook, but you will not be able to interact or ask questions from Facebook. If you would like to join us, it's not too late. You can go to the HCMA website at 4hcm.org and register and you'll get a link and you can join us live in the Zoom room where you can ask live questions during the event. So we're going to now swap back over to our Brady Bunch view and we are, oh, no, Julie, you didn't start the webinar. Okay, we haven't started yet. There's Okay, so we are now starting. So we have some people joining. So we have to give it a few minutes for everybody to start populating. So let's give it a second. We can. Now it's coming. <laughs> now it's coming. Yeah, they're, they're coming in. So we're going to remember that we're recording live and we're having a live session again on January 13th, 2020. But this session will last forever on our YouTube channel at 4HCM on YouTube, as well as on our website. So if we have different hairstyles the next time you see us, you know, it's just the way that it goes. But Chris has had the same hairstyle the whole time I've known him. So um, this will last for a while. We do remind you that questions answered and asked during these sessions um, are generalized. We will not be giving consult by webinar tonight if you have questions. We can answer some questions specifically, but some it does not uh, work that way because it's patient care and there's a lot of details and we need the physicians to actually see you to give them a, the uh, proper answers to your questions. So um, you are welcome to ask questions throughout the evening. I am going to be launching right now a poll that those who are joining us uh, in the webinar can participate in. And when I am done with my first talk of the night, I will go back and see who's joining us and we'll go over the demographics there. So without further ado, I'm Lisa Salberg, founder and CEO of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, joined tonight by two of my staff members, Amy Mann, our meeting and HCM Academy coordinator, and Julie Russo, our volunteer and intake coordinator. And they are here to assist you if you have any questions in chat. They will be answering them throughout the evening. And if our faculty has any questions, they can help you as well. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over quickly to Chris Kramer to introduce his staff at the University of Virginia to our audience this evening. Chris, welcome to the HCMA's Big Hearted Warrior Tour. And we can't wait to meet your staff. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be able to present to you tonight on behalf of uh, University of Virginia Health System. We've been a uh, HCM Center of Excellence since 2014, uh, working with Lisa and, uh, and staff. And uh, we're pleased to present to you tonight. Uh, I'll introduce the uh, speakers to you. Uh, after my introduction, uh, Michael Ayers uh, will uh, introduce uh, the HCM care at UVA. Michael joined us a couple of years ago from the University of Pennsylvania and has doing great work with the HCM uh, population. Matt Thomas, uh, our genetic counselor, will then follow with a discussion of HCM genetics in the family. 
Uh, I will then uh, follow Matt with a discussion on imaging in uh, HCM with a focus on cardiac magnetic resonance. Pamela Mason, who's uh, chief of our electrophysiology laboratory, will follow me with a discussion of the use of subcutaneous ICD in HCM. And after that, Michael Rogasta, Director of uh, Interventional Cardiology, and John Kern, Surgical Director of the Heart and Vascular Center at UVA, will discuss interventional therapy for obstructive HCM. And then we'll have a Q&A session, and we look forward to uh, getting your questions. Fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to an interesting night, great talks and discussion, and we hope that our participants will ask some questions, and you can use the Q&A box for your questions, not the chat feature. It's kind of hard for us to manage the chat feature, so if you have a question, you can post it in the question box, and our faculty may answer it in uh, typewritten form, or we may hold it to the end of a session. If we don't get to your question by the end of the session, at the conclusion of all sessions, we'll make sure that we've answered every question to the best of our ability this evening. Um, I am going to take over the screen for a little bit and tell you a little bit about some exciting new things going on here at the HCMA, and I'm glad to say most of it is exciting and new. So um, while I'm doing that and sharing my screen, I do remind all of our participants in the, the Zoom room to take the poll. Amy, do I get special points for making that announcement twice before I even started my talk? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, tonight we went over our agenda already. I wanted to take a moment. Oops, I've lost a slide here. My apologies to our sponsors, Cytokinetics, Bristol Myers Squibb, Invite, and Boston Scientific for their financial support of tonight's uh, session. Uh, they are uh, funders of the event. They do not provide any content or guidance on content. They are just benevolent donors to the cause. So thank you very much to our sponsors. And by the end of the night, I will put up a slide with their logos on it. Um, late breaking news, January 9th of this year, um, we started a new fund. It is called the Lori Fund. Lori was my sister, and as some of you may know and some of you may not know, we lost Lori in 1995 to mismanaged hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, each year on her birthday, I try to bring a new feature, a new program, a new website, all kinds of new stuff happens on January 9th. And this year we announced the start of the Lori Fund, which will be providing micro grants for travel for HCM patients to get to HCMA recognized center of excellence care or transplant care. We are going to start um, the fund. We started the fund on January 9th. We've accumulated about $1,800 into the fund already. Once we reach $5,000 in the fund, we will start taking applications for um, micro grants for those in need. There will be an application process, which will be put up online in the next couple of weeks. But we encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to please donate to the Lori Fund so that we can help those without the means get to the care that they so desperately need at a high volume, high quality HCMA recognized center of excellence or transplant program. To donate, you can just visit 4hcm.org. It's right on the front page of the website right now. And uh, we would appreciate your contributions. And we think that your fellow HCM patients living with uh, HCM who can't get to care will appreciate the uh, ability to get a small grant to be able to travel to a center. Okay, other late breaking news. We actually held our first session in this exciting new program today. This is called HCM Academy. HCM Academy is sponsored in part by um, Cytokinetics and Bristol Myers Squibb as well, uh, as well as, oh my goodness, who was the other one? Sanofi, I think it is. Sanofi, Sanofi. Um, there are four faculty members on the, on the national level, myself, Marty Marin, Anjali Owens from University of Pennsylvania, John Lynn Jeffries, um, who's down in uh, Memphis, and Marty, of course, at Tufts. And this program is an online learning module for medical professionals. So why am I bringing this up in a patient-centered meeting? Because patients will have the opportunity to go onto the HCMA website and refer their own personal physicians to take HCM Academy so that their local physicians can understand HCM at a deeper level. 
So what exactly is HCM Academy? There are six online CME educational modules, five online case studies featuring none other than five amazing HCMA warriors. And I'm you got to go watch the videos. Just go watch the videos. They're amazing. Um, then after they're done with the digital, there's an ability to take a, a workshop with a trainer. And today our very first session was led by Dr. Harry Lever, Cleveland Clinic, um, who educated six people on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and did a fantastic job from what I understand. So congratulations, Amy, on the first program actually being completed. So you can refer your own physicians in. Um, to our faculty, if you have physicians you would like to refer in, then go to our website, cut all clicks, and you can get them registered for HCM Academy. So it's not coming soon. The HCMAcademy.com is live now. Forgot to change that part of the slide, sorry. Um, oh yes, here, here, here's the financial disclosure. Um, again, they provided uh, funding for this program, but did not direct the content. And we really do appreciate the amount of resources that were put into this amazing program. Now it's our job to make sure people go out and take the classes so that we can spread HCM knowledge far and wide. Um, so you can go right to the HCMA website. You, start, you go right here to HCM Academy under programs and you will see the page. You can refer your provider. If you are a provider, you can go directly to refer yourself in and you will have the opportunity to take that course. Okay, why isn't it going? Another new program. So we've been working for two years uh, in the background here at the HCMA to help develop a comprehensive piece of legislation that will help us identify the currently undiagnosed. So what are we trying to do here? We're not setting up pop-up shops to do EKGs on the street. We're looking to provide medical education to healthcare providers about who might be at risk for diseases such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but other cardiac diseases that impact the young and potentially families. And we will be providing medical education to those individuals. And secondarily, we will be adding components to the well child examination that are the same as what's called the PPE when your kids take a sports physical and they ask them cardiac questions. Shockingly, the well child exam does not ask any cardiac questions. So we're just gonna marry the PPE questions into the well child examination, like we've done here in the state of New Jersey for the past five and a half years. And by this, we have the opportunity for the family to discuss with their healthcare provider what their individualized cardiac care risks might be. And if there's a family history of sudden death, transplant, heart failure, defibrillators, the doctor can ask the appropriate questions to see if maybe the family does need to be evaluated for cardiac disease, and we can help save lives by getting people to early diagnosis. We were cute in our naming here. We understand that. It's called the HCM Act, but that stands for the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. And you can take action tonight. You can do it tomorrow morning. You can do it from your cell phone. You can do it from your office. You go to the website and click on the link to the HCM Act, it'll take you to a software program called UJOIN. With a click and a couple of words, you can send a message to your state legislative representatives with a pre-written letter. You can add your own part. You can even add a video clip as to why you think it's important for people to understand their cardiac risks. You can tell your own story in 30 seconds and send it off in an email to your elected officials and start the process of building these laws. First, we have to get sponsors and we have to get them to write the actual piece of legislation. We got to bring it to committee. We got to bring it to the floor for a vote and then to the governors for a signature. This is state-based legislation. There is no real federal mechanism to get this type of action passed unless we're going to ERISA and that's a whole other complicated process that we're probably not going to get to. So we want to make sure we're going state by state. Virginia is on the list of states that we want to work with because we feel that they would readily accept such a logical piece of, of legislation. There's not a lot of funding required behind it. The education module, once we get a few states going, we do believe that industry will help sponsor the educational model. So it should be a, a budget neutral piece of legislation that is completely bipartisan. Everybody has a heart, we think, 
and everybody needs to make sure that their family is safe. So we encourage you to participate by clicking on and sending a letter to your state legislators. Um, we're building out some of our committees, our, our legislative committee who worked very hard to build this program up and all the supporting resources for the HCM Act are online and available to you. We are looking for a couple of new representatives to the legislative committee, as well as the patient education committee. Those individuals will be chosen in the next couple of days. So if you think you might be interested, please go to the website and sign up to become a volunteer. Mention what committee that you're interested in participating in because those committees run February to February and we're gonna be onboarding new members in the next six weeks. We are also starting our first ever health equity committee. We're very excited about this. It is really important to ensure that all populations are represented in the HCMA's world. And that means both on the healthcare provider side and the patient side, we want to make sure that we are truly representing the places where we live. And right now we have a little problem here in that most HCM centers and us collectively at the HCMA, approximately 87% of our population is Caucasian. And we know that that is not what the United States looks like today. It should be 60% Caucasian, 14% African-American Black. It should be 20% Latino and there should be Asian Americans and Native Americans in there as well. Our diversity in HCM programs is not where we would like it to be. So we need to do something about that. And the Health Equity Committee will be focusing on this issue. And I'm very excited to announce that in the one week's time, our three new co-chairs of our Medical Affairs Committee will be meeting for the first time. Uh, those chairs are um, Carl Hornig, who is a member of our board of directors and an epidemiologist. And from the HCM world, both Marty Marin and Steve Amon will be co-chairs of the Medical Affairs Committee. The HCMA has a lot of data in-house that we've been collecting for many, many years, not doing a whole hell of a lot with. So it will be part of the job of the Medical Affairs Committee to help determine what we should be doing with some of our survey results and what else we should be surveying. And we're going to be moving on to a more robust data set through a pro project, a program called REDCap. If you're in the medical world, you know what that is. If you're a patient, you don't know what that is. It's a system to coordinate data. And this will allow us to collaborate with our Center of Excellence partners on research initiative, initiatives in a new and exciting way that I've wanted to do for many, many years and didn't have the resources to do. And now we do, so I'm really excited. So we're looking forward to working with all of our Center of Excellence partners on that. And we still do have a couple of committee positions open. And then there's always going to be the writing committees of the committee the writing groups. So um, I'm sure some of our team members at UVA will be stepping up for some of those roles in the future and we look forward to working with them. Um, so what are HCMA recognized centers of excellence? Well, if you're in this call and you're listening to us today, you probably already know a little bit about it. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the details of the HCMA recognized center of excellence program, I send you to the website for that information. As of today, we have 43 programs throughout the country with 16 in process of review. COVID has slowed us down a little bit in our growth because medical institutions are a little busy with other things right now. And we do support our frontline workers and sit patiently by waiting to get these evaluations done. But we do desperately need more HCM care out there because there are patients that are lost right now. Uh, at this point in time, we believe that we have between 45 and 55,000 individuals housed at HCMA recognized center of excellence care models. And we're very excited about that because that gives us an opportunity to do bigger and better clinical trials, understand HCM at a deeper level, make sure the right patients get to the right procedures at the right time. And this is showing so much promise today. Um, I say things with a little bit of tongue in cheek sometimes, but back in 2020, when the AHA and ACC republished their guidelines, they described what, uh, what an HCM patient's care should look like. And they described HCMA recognized centers of excellence without using that word. They called them comprehensive HCM programs and primary HCM programs. But that's the validation that I worked 25 years for that this model actually works and it changes outcomes and it changes lives. So we encourage you all, if you can get to a center of excellence to please do so. If finances are the issue and the LORI fund becomes available, please use the resources available to ensure that you and your family are getting the highest quality care possible. 
if you need support and you don't know where to go and it's not a time for a doctor's appointment, we encourage you to use social media. I know social media has its good sides and its bad sides, but Facebook has been really good to the HCM community. We have a wonderful private discussion group. Private is 8,000 people right now, so it's not really private private. Private group means it's not going to show on your Facebook feed. If you would like to talk about your HCM, you don't have to worry that all your friends and family are going to see it because it's in a private group. It's private. Um, we have a number of groups that are building up internationally. Very excited about this. We call this HCMAI. We are developing both international HCM care programs and patient advocacy outreach. We are working with people in Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, and I have a couple of other ones coming up as well. Uh, Japan is coming up. So we're very excited to start spreading the word about HCM and ensuring that patients with HCM have access to peer-to-peer -peer support throughout the world in their native language. So very excited about that. I'm excited about a lot of things right now. So I'm sorry if I'm using the word excited a lot, but there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Okay, if you don't know about these already, we have online discussion groups that meet all week that you can go to the HCMA website to learn where you can pick up one of these discussion groups and join. Um, these groups, they've been going for about a year now, you know, it takes a little time to get things rolling. Um, in our last transplant group, I think we had 13 or 14 individuals at some point, either post-transplant, um, listed for transplant or getting listed for transplant. And in the first week of 2022, we had three of our warriors transplanted in this country. Our transplant numbers are growing and we're happy about that. I know it's not so weird thing to be happy about, but 15, 20 years ago, these patients would not have made it to transplant in these numbers and they wouldn't have survived much longer. So we're really grateful to the advances made and the ability to have a discussion group just on that one topic. While it only affects 5% of the population, it's important to that 5% that they have a place to be heard. We have other discussion groups that focus on pre-myectomy, post-myectomy, ICDs, family history issues, um, just coping with HCM in general, mental health issues. So we encourage you all to take a look at those discussion groups and sign in and join one. They're great people just like you who have HCM who are running these groups. They're amazing volunteers and we thank them profusely for their time, effort, passion, and ability to communicate. Um, so I wanted to be on my other station today, my podcast station, where I have my cool new artwork, but you're just going to have to join us tomorrow morning at uh, 11 o'clock for Tales from the Heart, a podcast, where tomorrow I will be joined by Dr. Martin Marin at Tufts, where we will have the discussion of planning your HCM year. It's January, we can kind of look forward. What do we have to do this year? What tests are required? Why are they required? How frequently should they be done? And just a robust conversation about what's coming in the next year to the HCM community. Um, and then every other month, I will be joined by either Dr. Harry Lever or Dr. Steve Amon for a standing appointment every other week. And then in the alternate weeks, I have interesting guests that are joining me. And this month, I'm joined by Michael Papali, and he wrote a book called A Big Heart, a Memoir. Um, I first came to know Mike when he was in a coma after a cardiac arrest as a teenager, and his mother called the HCMA seeking help. He has since recovered, grown up, got his college education under him, is now working in the portable defibrillator industry, as well as started his own small nonprofit to help provide AEDs to those in need. And he is an amazing HCM warrior who's doing amazing things out there and he and I are gonna be joined for a discussion in a couple of weeks. So I believe that's next, not this Friday, but next Friday. And then the following Friday will be Dr. Uh, Harry Lever. So we're really excited to bring another season of Tales from the Heart. We got, I think 40 some odd episodes under our belt right now and looking forward to a lot more. So if you are into podcasts, I can't believe I'm saying this, but pick it up wherever you pick up your podcast. We're on iTunes and Audibles and Spotify and all kinds of weird places. And we will have other topics. So when Chris Kramer publishes this next really cool article on HCM, he's going to call me up and say, hey, Lisa, let's podcast this. And we'll podcast it. And we'll talk in depth about the, the article. Um, if you haven't already done so and you're interested in genetic testing, and we're going to hear more from Matt Thomas tonight about that, 
We have a wonderful sponsored program from Invite that you can get access to through the HCMA's website. It's called Detect HCM, and this is free to patients with a diagnosis of HCM or a family history of HCM for free genetic testing. Um, you can read more about the program online, and we thank Invite for their support and the funding that has been made possible to make that program possible. So I want to thank everybody tonight, our UVA partners, our other recognized Center of Excellence partners, the staff and board of the HCMA, and all of our volunteers. And of course, Brandy, for those of you who don't know, Brandy was my donor's name. And I would be remiss if I did not thank my heart donor every moment I possibly can and to donor families everywhere. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to be here today. So with that, I say thank you very much. And I know I'm little shot out of a cannon, but it's been a crazy week and we've got so much going on and I'm excited about it. But now we're gonna get on to our next talk and I'm gonna remind you all to do the poll. Amy, look at that, I did it again. Um, we've got 59% uh, of you doing it right now. So I'm gonna wait until after the first talk before I give the demographics. Uh, so Michael, I'm gonna hand it off to you to tell everybody how they can navigate getting care at UVA, and then I'll tell them what the survey results are. Thank you so much, Lisa. Let me just start by saying again, thank you to you and to the whole HCMA. I think I speak on behalf of all of the clinicians that will talk today that we are just in awe of the advocacy you do for not just our patients, but for HCMA, HCM patients and, and their families everywhere. So thank you. Um, with that said, you're going to hear some really fantastic talks on some narrower topics throughout the day. So what I want to do is a more of a broad overview on HCM and how it relates to our Center of Excellence at UVA. So we'll start by making sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the definition, and then we'll go through some cornerstones of management. And I really want to use those cornerstones in order to introduce some of the cast of characters you're going to see at UVA as not just a way to think about the disease, but to think about how we've structured our center. Because ultimately, as Lisa's made very clear, it, it takes a team, it takes a family to take care of these. And I think Dr. Kramer uh, has really set up a group here that, that is a family in taking care of these patients. With that said, um, HCM is defined, as I'm sure most of the people here know as a patient who has a wall in their heart thicker than 1.5 centimeters in absence of some other cause. And when I meet with patients, I sort of divide this disease into four different pillars of management. The first pillar is the genetic piece. This is the most common inherited heart condition in the world. The second is heart failure, which my patients tell me over and over, you guys tell me this is a terrible term, I agree. Heart failure meaning your heart's behaving in a way that's making you more short of breath. Arrhythmias, abnormal heart rhythms, and lifestyle. But if you'll notice, I left a circle around HCM because as we approach each of these different pillars, ultimately the gatekeeper to these different arenas is gonna be cardiac imaging. Now, one of the things that I implore the audience members is when you seek out your center for HCM, I really want you to make sure it's not just a place that's comfortable with echo that's going to tell you how the heart is moving and where the pressures are building up in different areas, but you need to make sure that it's an, uh, a center that's very comfortable with cardiac MRI because cardiac MRI is gonna give us the ability to not just look at how the heart's shaped and how it's moving, but what is going on on a tissue level. It's gonna characterize the tissue itself. And I think this is pivotal for the management of HCM, which is why we're so lucky to have Dr. Kramer as the head of our center of excellence, because he's made a good part of his career as being a world expert in the utilization of cardiac MRI for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. With that said, let's go over to genetics. Um, patients usually want to discuss genetics with respect to their personal risk, but to be quite frank with you, when I'm thinking about genetics, once I have a history and once I have the appropriate imaging, I have a good idea of how the management's going to go for patients moving forward. But where genetics becomes really important 
is when we start talking about not just how does the disease relate to you, but as a genetic disease, how does this relate to those you love and those around you? your family. And that's why we're so lucky to have really one of the, the head lead genetic counselors in, in the country, Matt Thomas, uh, to help guide us through the morass of genetics, which can get quite complicated at times, but he has this just magnificent way of making it simplified, not just for us clinicians, but for families. With that, I'm going to move into heart failure as the second pillar or area of management. Most of the time when we're talking about heart failure, shortness of breath due to a thick heart muscle, uh, in HCM, we're talking about obstructive disease. Now, obstructive disease means the center wall, the septum dividing the left and right heart has gotten so thick that it's impeding blood flow out of the heart. If you could picture a hose leaving the heart and kind of choking down on the hose, that's an obstructive picture. The mainstay of this is still medicines by and large. However, there's a good deal of patients that need interventions, and those interventions come in two different flavors. One is transcatheter interventions, where we're going through the skin up to the heart, and the other is surgical, where we're going through the center of the chest. Most places will have one person who does either or of these, but we're very fortunate at UVA to have two people that are really experts in both of these arenas. We have Dr. Regasta, who performs our alcohol ablations. That's the catheter approach. And we have Dr. Kern, who you're seeing on the bottom part here. And we're going to see them talk later today about some obstructive cases. I have to share with you briefly, uh, Dr. Kern's name was well known to me before I came here as a preeminent surgeon across the country in cardiothoracic disease. But Dr. Regasta actually wrote the textbook that we use in cardiac catheterization at many fellowships. And I have to tell you, some medical students and residents that just came back from interview came back to me and said, everybody asked if I'd read the Regasta. So these are really big names throughout the country when we're dealing with obstruction and we're, we're very lucky to have them. Um, now, if you don't have obstructive disease, which will be about two thirds of patients, you're dealing with non-obstructive disease. For the most part, this again is going to be dealt with with medicines. However, we're fortunate at UVA that right down the hall, we have the ability to begin discussing advanced therapies like heart transplantation, which some patients with HCM might go on to need. And this is a picture of Dr. Bergen, who's not formally a member of the Center of Excellence, but whom I frequently discuss patients with in terms of deciding, is this someone we need to plug into thinking about a transplant now? When's the right time? Next up is arrhythmias as our sort, third sort of pillar. Uh, abnormal heart rhythms can come from both the bottom and the top in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When they come from the top, they're known as atrial arrhythmias, the most common being AFib or atrial fibrillation. This is about a third of patients. This tends to carry with it a worse prognosis and tends to cause a lot of symptoms. So we're very aggressive in managing AFib. The second, which patients are also reasonably quite concerned about, are ventricular abnormal rhythms, abnormal rhythms from the bottom. These are associated with sudden death. For these discussions, we're frequently turning to our electrophysiology experts. These are the heart rhythm experts. Uh, we have Dr. McDaniels and Dr. Mason here, and we're going to hear from Dr. Mason later. Um, I have to tell her, I, I tell you, I, I'm emailing Dr. Mason very frequently about how to approach different rhythms in all of these patients. And again, it is a team effort. Let's move now into lifestyle, which frequently kind of gets put on the back burner. If you'll notice in the guidelines, you know, it's the last thing mentioned, but for patients, it's first on their mind. And one of the first things they want to discuss when it comes to lifestyle is exercise. What's safe for me? If you Google this, there's a lot of information, but there's also a lot of misinformation out there. And so we spend a good deal of time with our first appointments talking about your values. What's important to you? What exercise do you like doing? And then we discuss what the risk of those various exercises may or may not be. And we come up with a plan together, a shared plan on how you're gonna move forward. Lastly, I also wanna uh, mention comorbidities, other illnesses. It's so easy to become hyper fixated in, is there obstruction, is there not obstruction? Do we need a defibrillator? Do we not need a defibrillator? You wanna make sure that your doctor is also thinking about your blood pressure your cholesterol, your migraines, things that every other American has to think about. For the general management like this, um, I see a lot of our patients now. Dr. Kramer is our division chief, and he's had to take a little bit of a back 
role in terms of accepting new patients, but he also sees a lot of patients in clinic. And then from a pediatric standpoint, we have Dr. LaCoyer, who sees a lot of our patients as well. Um, while I'm on the topic of team and before I transfer off this slide, just as two quick examples, I have to tell you, Dr. Kramer's nurse, Peggy, has been doing this a long time, and she's somewhat of an expert now herself. And if you've got Dr. Kramer in clinic, chances are you've talked to Peggy Dame, his nurse. Likewise, Karen McLean, my nurse, is becoming an expert in HCM and is part of this team that's constantly communicating with all of these other individuals. This is the latest UVA national champion, the lacrosse team. And just to emphasize again, this is a team sport because we're approaching this at UVA as a family. Ultimately, you wanna know that you're being taken care of by people that are communicating all the time with one another. We're starting this year a new uh, quarterly conference where we take the more difficult cases and all of the cast of characters that you saw on the previous slide get together and we discuss, what do we do with some of these trickier situations? With that said, brief summary, and then I think I'm uh, turning into a pumpkin in terms of my 10 minutes. Um, we talked about the four pillars of management, arrhythmias, heart failure, genetics, and lifestyle, and the different uh, experts that are taking care of these different areas. We talked about imaging really as a linchpin in the management of this disease and how fortunate we are to have such a strong cardiac MRI program. We talked about the absolute importance of shared decision making because HCM is a team sport. Again, thank you to Lisa and the HCMA for this uh, incredible opportunity. Um, one of your many incredible opportunities that you have offered for all of us. Thank you so much. Michael, thank you so much. That was very comprehensive, exactly the way I view HCM care as well as that, that team effort. And these are big teams. So I'm sorry to anybody who had a difficult time with the poll. I guess we were having some technical issues with it, but I'm going to end the poll right now. And before I hand it over to our genetic counselor extraordinaire, Matt, I'm gonna go over the cast of characters so you know who you're talking to tonight. Okay, um, oops, what the heck just happened there? I don't know where it all just went. Hold the phone, there it goes. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share the results with you guys all. Um, we have, oh, we've got a mix between the Northeast and uh, the Southeast is just slightly edging you out. We have members from the Southwest, Midwest and the West. We are all US based this evening here. Now we also have, what is your relationship to HCM? So 57% are patients, 5% are patients, but also have a family member who is affected. 19% have a family member who are affected. 5% have a friend. You're a good friend for being in here. So thank you. We have 10% that are medical professionals and somebody from industry tonight and no just curious type people. Um, we are looking at people with different experiences. 33% um, have been diagnosed within the past two years. And then we have, oops, what happened here? Sorry, I just ran into a little problem. Uh, we're diagnosed in the last two years. So those are people, it's a little stressful the first two years, people hang in there, it gets easier. Those first two years are quite stressful. 67% um, are on medication, 40% have an ICD. These are of responders, remember. 14% have had a septal myectomy or alcohol septal ablation. 29% have AFib. 14% of us have lost family members to HCM. There are two transplant patients here tonight. I'm one and Amy's the other. Um, so they may not be in the crowd, but they're on the, on the screen. 43% uh, of us have had genetic testing. And we have somebody, a couple of people who have been advised to consider septal reduction therapy and are trying to make that decision. And I'm sure tonight we're gonna to give them a lot to think about. So it shows you a little bit of the diversity of HCM and how we're all coming to this from slightly different points of view. Um, if you were unable to complete the survey, I apologize, but I think we're probably representing you because you're probably just throwing those numbers up a little bit more someplace else. Um, okay. So without further ado, um, I'm very happy to say that we are really lucky in the HCM community to have some really skilled and knowledgeable genetic counselors working with our families to help us understand the complex maze that is genetics. 
And there are but a handful that are really high volume genetic counselors in HCM. And Matt Thomas is one of them. So Matt, no pressure. We're just, you know, banking on you to really represent those genetic counselors. And thank you. And the stage is yours. I knew I was gonna talk with my new button on. Um, thank you so much. So before I start sharing my screen, um, I, I've taken on a partially new role as Associate Chair for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. So I'm grateful that you all have taken that as a priority uh, in, your, in your committee work. So thank you for that. I also did download the podcast. So it's, uh, you're gonna get another, uh, another credit there and I'm going to listen. Um, and thank you for those of you that are watching now or in the future. And if you're in the future and you can send us a message on when the pandemic ends, I'd greatly appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Tell me what you're seeing. Your screen. You're good. Okay. All right. So not the slide, slide sharing part. You're good. Excellent. So sorry for that delay there. Um, so as Lisa said, I'm Matt Thomas, I'm a genetic counselor. And for those of you who haven't been seen um, in an HCM center that has a genetic counselor, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do. And most people know what cardiologists do. Some people presume I'm a physician because I'm a genetic counselor, but I'm not Mr. Matt Thomas, but call me Matt. Um, for those of you who have seen Office Space, it's a favorite movie of mine. I don't wanna admit how old it is for our younger members of the audience, but if you haven't seen it, it's phenomenal. And there's a scene where two consultants show up at a company that's dealing with some redundancies. They're interviewing this gentleman here and asking him, what is it that you do here? Um, and like this gentleman, I feel like I have some people skills. I understand genetics. I understand how to talk to people about some complicated issues, how to communicate with their family. Um, I would say I generally don't lose it like this. So you won't see me break down like this gentleman here but I hopefully can help tell you what the story is of what genetic counseling is with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and how we navigate the family with genetic testing um, and family screening. So this evening, I'm gonna go through these four topics as quickly as I can. One, the importance of a family history, what I need to know, two, family heart screening, three, genetic testing, and then some other topics along the way. So family history is probably where I start after doing an introduction and getting to know what brings somebody to see me in clinic, whether they're whether I'm seeing them alongside Dr. Ayers, Dr. Kramer in our in our adult clinic or our pediatric providers. And the role of the family history is to do a few things. So when I take the family history, what I start with is basically collecting as many family members as possible. So you may have had somebody ask you, do you have a family history of HCM? And you'd say yes or no generally, and they might ask who's affected. And they might also ask, is there a family history of sudden death? And you may have an answer to that question, yes or no. I go one by one through family members. So first, first degree relatives, parents, siblings, children, second degree relatives, grandparents, aunts, uncles, grandchildren, third degree relatives, cousins, great grandparents. I don't go through every single family member one by one, but those individuals who have some concerning signs and symptoms, I track that down to better understand, is this familial HCM or not? What I pay attention to in the family history, the obvious is if there's a family history of HCM, if there's a family history of sudden death, and then there's other things that are red flags. So it's probably not surprising that people can confuse all types of heart diseases. So people will frequently say when somebody has a sudden cardiac arrest that they had a heart attack. And so if I hear a patient say that they had a family member have a heart attack at 25 years old while they were at work or while they were exercising or while they were at rest, um, I try to figure out, was it really a heart attack? Did they have heart attack treatment or it might've been a cardiac arrest? And I also get records. Our team gets records, especially if we're seeing healthy family members for screening and the original patient who's diagnosed is not a member of our center because it does make a difference in how we screen the family. How I collect the family history. Um, even though I'm not a physician, apparently I have handwriting like a physician. I got some feedback from, uh, you saw Dr. Bergen's picture. He, he sort of stopped me one day and he said, hey, have you seen this pedigree drawing program before? And I said, no, I haven't. So I've been using an iPad for the past, I don't know, six years now. Uh, and so my family history is in my notes that you see in my chart uh, or that I'd send to your referring doctor look like this. So it basically identifies who's affected with, a, with HCM, who's had any sort of suspected heart issue who's had genetic testing, and I document it in this picture to help sort of summarize things very clearly and without having to write out text and text and obviously draw out my terrible handwriting. 
And why family history is important, uh, one as a patient, is it helps determine if you may be recommended to get a defibrillator. Um, so if you have a family history of sudden death, there is a recommendation for consideration of an ICD for those patients. And that can be added to the decision that you'd make with your electrophysiologist and your HCM cardiologist. My role is to figure out who's had heart screening and who's at risk for HCM and how we're gonna follow those family members. So family heart screening, I'm not starting with genetic testing as my conversation after the family history because I want to know if anybody's affected first. Um, and if we can get heart screening done, it's ideal to make sure people are healthy. So what that means to me is not just getting an echocardiogram and EKG ordered by a primary care provider. Ideally, they're meeting with a cardiologist. If we can see a family member or family members of our patients that happen to live in the area as a part of our HCM service, that's great. Um, however, if they're not living in the state or not able to reach us, I want them to ideally see a cardiologist to have the echo and EKG done and reviewed by the person who's reviewing the information itself to determine, are you affected? Or are you not affected? And sometimes the imaging is more involved in echo and EKG, depending on whether their uh, pictures taken by echo are clear or not. To speak to our pediatric team who aren't presenting this evening, um, you've heard about Dr. LaCure. Um, doctors McCulloch and White are our cardiomyopathy pediatric cardiologists. So if you have children that are seen in our center, one of the three of these cardiologists will be seeing them and following them over time before they transition to the adult practice. And Dr. George McDaniel, who was mentioned before, is our electrophysiologist in pediatrics, is responsible for any um, EP procedures like ablations and, and um, devices like a defibrillator. Um, and who gets screening? Well, it's close family first. And I don't mean close like the family that you care about the most, like that's kind of like, I understand you tell this history like the most first, but talking about biologically close, like first degree relatives, siblings, parents, children. Um, the closest family has shares the most genetics with you. Half your DNA you share with your parents, siblings, and children. So it's important for those individuals who screen first. And then if anybody is symptomatic, if you hear about a cousin who's been fainting when they were exercising, you hear somebody complaining about shortness of breath that they didn't have a couple months ago. If anybody has symptoms, they need to be in and need to be screened. And when you start the screening is once the diagnosis is made. So if you learn about an HCM diagnosis in your family and you haven't had heart screening yet, and you haven't been cleared by genetic testing, then getting heart screening will be important. And we start that at any age, including young children, because we know this sometimes can present very early, even in families where the first person is diagnosed as an adult. The frequency of screening depends on the age of the person who's affected. Um, so we generally say start the screening um, uh, every one to three years in childhood and young adulthood, and then transition every three to five years when you reach adulthood. And obviously if with the onset of symptoms. And the reason for this is detecting disease early so you can prevent any complications or um, any uh, outcomes, um, you know, obviously the tragedy of a sudden death or just things that you wouldn't have to suffer with if you underwent treatment first. And of course, genetic testing is a part of it. It's a part of the title of what I do. Um, and genetic testing has an important role. And I'm gonna start with a why first. So why do we do genetic testing? Right now in 2022, I almost said 21, in 2022, the biggest value is to figure out who's not at risk, who doesn't need to have ongoing heart screening, who doesn't have to be concerned that they may develop it in the future. I'm hopeful that genetic testing one day will be used to help determine specific treatments um, with all of the research and funding that's going into novel therapies. But for now, the biggest value is to figure out who's not at risk. You can always use genetic testing if it's positive and somebody is at risk to determine that they do need heart screening to continue but that's gonna be a mainstay of their evaluation if they don't have testing at all. Um, the genetic testing that's offered, I generally order a, a genetic testing panel of cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia genes, whether it's a sponsored panel where things can be done for free or for it's a targeted panel for HCM, it's very lab dependent. Uh, and basically these are available at a number of laboratories. Um, I'm not providing any recommendations on which one is best or worst, et cetera. There's a number of options and they all um, spend a lot of time. I definitely would talk with somebody who's experienced in ordering genetic testing to pick one that has the most experience, but there's a lot of high quality labs out there. Um, who do we offer testing to? I think we're in an era where we should be doing genetic testing and offer genetic testing to anybody who is affected by HCM. With the potential of future therapies and the, and the future, the, the, possible, the, the affordability of testing. Um, when I started at UVA 15, almost 15 years ago, genetic testing was 
not covered by insurance, incredibly expensive, and things are dramatically different now where people can even get testing without any out-of-pocket expense. And the impact this can have on family who's at risk can be quite significant. Possible results. This is something I review with every single patient that I offer testing to. So one result is if the testing's positive. So you'll see a report like this. Genetic testing is really fancy and technical, but ultimately we get a PDF or a sheet of paper with the results in it that I send through my chart and by email. And this is an example of a patient with HCM who had a pathogenic or disease causing gene change and one of the most common causes of HCM and YPPC3. So this explains the disease and now you can offer this testing for this specific gene change to family. Results can also be negative. You can have HCM, you can even have a hereditary form of it where it's multiple generations and we just cannot find the gene change for a number of reasons. And then there's the in-between result, which is we find changes in genes, one or more, um, and we don't exactly know whether either any of them contribute to the disease. And we put a pin in this and we say, let's review this in the future. And that's what the guidelines recommend. And that's what we do is let's reconsider inconclusive results and reconsider abnormal results every, every so often to make sure that the information we knew about, say when they were tested in 2018, is the same in 2022 and beyond. I just got an email today. I snippeted the text out and anonymized it where one of my patients had a NYBPC3 gene change of uncertain significance that was just reclassified. And now her other at-risk family members can be offered testing. So it went from this result to this result. And it doesn't change her diagnosis medical care today, but it allows the family who's at risk to be screened. Um, when, when we were offered the opportunity to, to do this talk, um, to talk about our center and, and, and um, HCM centers in general, said, well, uh, the people who watch like to know what's going to be headed in the future. And, and I'm not an expert in, in gene therapy um, or an expert in sort of uh, the molecular basis of HCM from the perspective of novel therapeutics. But I can say that one of the specific areas I think we can make a difference in families today and then moving forward as we do more research in the community is through family screening. And so two groups that have HCM centers or, or serve HCM patients, the Michigan group, and forgive me if there's any Ohio State folks in the audience, and the group out of Australia, and forgive me if this is too stereotypically Australian, that's just what came to mind when I Google image, so forgive me, it's cute though. Well, they both put together papers that summarize their large HCM patient population and what they revealed, which is something that many of us were seeing in clinic, which is you take a patient with HCM, you do, they offer them genetic testing, genetic testing is normal, and then you encourage their family members to get screened, they all get screening done. It's repeated every couple of years. Nobody else is diagnosed. You have one person diagnosed with HCM. Those individuals tend to be later life diagnosed. They tend to have other risk factors like high blood pressure, sleep apnea, and other factors. And nobody else appears to be affected. And so there's now this category that's non-familial HCM. And why this is important is to sort out how often individuals who have non-familial, presumably HCM, need to have heart screening because the guidelines still recommend it to be done very frequently. And, and if any of you, all of you have had echocardiograms or cardiology testing, you know that the cost can add up over time. So I wanted to break this down quite simply to say, it looks like around 40% of our patients that, are, that have HCM break into this pie chart of non-familial HCM. Whereas the familial category includes people who test positive for the gene, that causes their disease or individuals who have a familial disease in the yellow, but we can't find the gene that's responsible. And then there's a small percentage I can't cover today that have uh, conditions that mimic HCM like Fabry disease or Noonan syndrome. And so the way I was thinking about this and I'm hoping that we'll be able to be integrated into guidelines in the future is to figure out what to do if you have familial HCM. So if you have a family member and you are affected and or you've had genetic testing that's positive, we now know that genetic testing and family heart screening is a way to figure out if other people are affected in the future. If we don't know if it's familial or non-familial, meaning we don't know the family history someone's adopted, or people aren't taking up the chance to do heart screening, aren't able to do it for financial reasons or personal reasons, or genetic testing is not informative or unable to be done, then that's where guideline-based heart screening is the way to go, no question. And I think the question that I wonder about for the future is what we can do for those families where people are later diagnosed in life, have no family history, and all family members have been screened who are able to. Genetic testing is normal. And maybe we might consider doing family heart screening less often to save the burden for those family members. 
I know I'm going over time, so I'm just going to end with other topics. So reproductive decision making can be made because this condition is often autosomal dominant. And if we know the gene responsible, people have prenatal diagnostic and reproductive options to make as, as families. Um, we cover genetic discrimination. This is mostly important for people who are concerned about how testing positive for a gene can impact certain types of insurance. This is most important for somebody who is healthy in considering genetic testing. And lastly, I don't have long-term training and or training in long-term counseling and support. I certainly assess how my patients are doing, and particularly during this difficult couple of years. I'm very proud to say we have a, a, a therapist, a counselor, a psychologist who's trained specifically in cardiovascular um, uh, um, psychology and health psychology that can see patients both in person and remotely for those that have additional needs that we can support. Um, so in summary, I encourage those in the audience who have HCM and, and themselves or their family, gather family history as much as possible, share that with your HCM provider. Um, if you haven't already, and I'm sure most of you and many of you have, um, encourage family heart screener genetic testing in the family members when it's familial. And then questions for your HCM provider, your HCM team. Can they reassess your test results? Are there any changes to the interpretation over time? And would you consider your HCM familial, non-familial, or you're not quite sure? Um, thank you for your attention, um, and back to you, Lisa. My cursor wouldn't find the mute button, so I was going to start talking on mute too, so it happens to all of us. Now, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for being so comprehensive. We do have a couple of questions for you that I will address now while we're on topic. Um, one of the questions is, if a sibling had genetic testing and does not have the quote, faulty gene, do the kids need to be tested every year? And I'm going to qualify this question with an assumption that I'm going to assume in this case that the index patient, maybe the person asking the question, had been genetically tested, had found a causative gene that was viewed as pathogenic or likely pathogenic, and had their sibling screened sibling screened clear, do they have to screen the children of that sibling? Thank you for those qualifiers, because I, I read that a completely different way. So if we know the gene that's causing the HCM in your family, the gene change, and we've proven that the family member at risk doesn't carry that gene change, then that means they are, cannot pass down that gene change to their children. A lot of us and patients feel that, oh, you have your grandmother's eyes or your grandfather's hair. And so you think that things can skip generations, but the, the good news about genetic testing when we know the gene responsible is if you found it and you prove somebody does not carry it and you're hundred percent or as certain as you can be that causes HCM, then you do not need to offer testing to the children. And then heart screening is not needed if you not believe that people are at risk and they're asymptomatic. Thank you. Next question comes from Bruce. Um, he was diagnosed long ago at, and he's interested in getting his son genetically tested. He had genetic testing four years ago that is inconclusive. So I'm not sure if it was a VUS or a no mutation found, but have the panels improved significantly in the past four years and are all panels created equally and are all interpretations of all panels created equally? I can just see your, your, your brain churning with this. You've heard this question a lot and I hear it too. So there's no, there's no perfect test. There's no perfect place to get a test and there's not a perfect interpretation. But what we can say is that the testing we have now is better than it was five or 10 years ago. But it all depends on the genes that were tested and where that variant of uncertain significance is and what gene it's in. Um, the short answer is what I generally do or recommend is take the past testing to somebody who has some genetics experience and in interpreting HCM related genes and say, does this one have any promise? Because sometimes these variants can be reclassified as this is the answer and can be used to screen family. Um, there is the option of retesting, which would probably give you the same variant that was found before and test for other gene changes as well. I just admit that there's been studies on doing testing from a couple of years prior, say five years prior, and the, the chance of finding a diagnosis after a small number of years is not very high. But I'll admit, again, that testing is very affordable, easy enough to do, so it's reasonable to consider it. I would just say, let's review the variant itself, and then reconsidering testing might be a good idea. Okay, so I'm going to do a follow-up question similar 
and then I'm going to make a comment on one of the questions. Um, so somebody else is asking, like I did it, I did genetic testing, you know, in 14, I did it in 2020. When do I go back and do it again? No mutations were identified. I'm going to qualify this with a newer theory, I'll call it, and that this is this. We used to think there were going to be genetic modifiers, but is there this potential that there's multiple different genes that are flawed and they create in such a pattern that they create HCM, but we don't know what all of the, the recipes are at this point? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I, I the, the way I, I would try to distinguish, at least this is how I, it makes sense to me, is if, you, if you're seeing it in multiple generations or you're seeing a number of people in one family that have HCM, then it's likely the autosomal dominant, mostly caused by one gene version of HCM. And so that risk is up to 50% of passing that down to a family member, a child, or having a sibling with it, et cetera. Um, if you're the only person diagnosed with the condition, then it is more likely that if your genetic testing is normal and heart screening your family is normal, it's probably a combination of both genes that have a small effect on the heart and its growth and development, and also some lifestyle things, blood pressure being probably the most important. And so it's, it, it's there, and there's probably in between answers as well, but I think that's the way that I think about it. I think the non-familial ones are probably a combination of both genetics and sort of environment, you know, you know blood pressure, et cetera. Um, and then the ones that are clearly running in the family, I, I generally still think of those as more likely to be autosomal dominant and, and then dealing in single gene that's responsible, sarcomere or otherwise. Okay, last genetic testing question, and then we're gonna get on to the next talk. Um, so his son was tested 12 years ago, MIBPC3 found. Younger sibling tested negative, but be, I'm assuming tested negative genetically, that's an assumption, but because the son had an extreme presentation at a young age, it was suggested to have younger son screened every few years for other potential unknown genes. So is there the possibility that there could be multiple genes within one family that may be responsible for HCM in that particular family? Yeah, it's, it's humbling. Um, occasionally we have situations where this doesn't happen in HCM as often as it does in other inherited heart diseases, fortunately, but there are situations where we're concerned enough that somebody doesn't have just one cause of their HCM. So they have one gene change, let's say MYBPC3, like in this example, and that's say inherited by a parent who didn't develop the disease until earlier, but their child got it, say, at birth or one year old. It doesn't make logical sense for the gene to be that dramatically different. And so our feeling generally is let's be absolutely certain that there's not another gene that's responsible, even if we couldn't detect it. So that's where heart screening might be recommended in that situation. Um, it's, it's unsatisfying to be able to completely not be able to dismiss somebody um, from surveillance, but in situations where we're concerned there's another underlying cause that we just didn't find, that's what we rely on. I think the Q&A session after your talk was very clear to those listening that we are not living in a black and white world in genetics. These are a thousand shades of gray, and we have to be really careful about how we ask questions and make sure we're asking the right question before we assume that the answer that we're getting is all encompassing. It's very nuanced work. And that is why people like Matt Taylor are really important to this world to go into those really nuanced details. So um, I, I think UVA is lucky to have you, Matt. And you can go back and look at all my other talks. I don't say that very often, but you do bring something very unique and special to this team. So thank you for that. And we're going to get on to our next talk now. And we're going to bring up the big guy. Um, we're going to bring up Chris Kramer and we're going to talk about imaging and MRI. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> and thanks for uh, putting together these uh, terrific uh, programs. We're, again, delighted to uh, participate at, at, at UVA for speaking for the, the whole team here. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the use of imaging in HCM, which is uh, Michael Ayers uh, uh, suggested is really the linchpin of, of making the diagnosis. And I'll, I'll uh, focus on, on CMR, but I'll discuss echocardiography as well, since it's uh, 
so important. So really going to focus on the two most important imaging uh, modalities, testing modalities in HCM. The first is echocardiography or ultrasound. We use that uh, as the primary uh, modality to identify patients with HCM, and it may be through screening of family members, but it may be due to testing because of symptoms and it, or, or uh, preoperatively or for before a procedure that, that patients uh, un, for unusual reasons get diagnosed with HCM. Importantly, echo is used to measure septal thickness and that's can be important uh, decision-making measurement. Uh, importantly, echo is used to measure the what's called the outflow track gradient from the left ventricle and that is uh, seen that that gradient is found in about two thirds of patients with HCM and uh, frequently leads to their symptoms of shortness of breath or, or difficulty doing their, their daily activities. Echo is also used to uh, assess leak in the, the mitral valve, which uh, often goes along with the presence of the outflow track gradient that I, I just spoke about. The second uh, imaging modality that's really come to the fore in the last 10 to 15 years is cardiac magnetic resonance imaging or CMR. CMR is more sensitive for subtler forms of disease. Uh, echo can be difficult for various reasons in 10 to 15% of patients. And so uh, CMR can be useful in those patients with difficult echoes. And also uh, when there's a question, CMR generally gets the, the answer right 100% of the time. It accurately identifies subtypes of HCM, and I'll go over that more in a moment. And importantly, CMR is the only technique that is able to identify and quantify the amount of scar in the heart, which is seen in about half of patients with HCM and has become important in decision make, making about uh, implanting defibrillators. And again, I'll talk more about that in a, in, in a moment. So let's start with ECHO because again, ECHO is the most common modality that's used to make the diagnosis, and it's used commonly to follow patients with, H with HCM. CMR is used generally once around the time of diagnosis, occasionally in follow-up, but we, we, we still are learning how to use it in follow-up. But echo is generally done, uh, when I see my patients, I generally repeat echoes on a yearly basis. So this is a, a view of the heart in a patient with a very significant hypertrophy of their interventricular septum, which is diagnostic of HCM, as, as Dr. Ayer said, if it's more than 15 millimeters uh, across, uh, that's uh, without a, another underlying cause of that uh, increased wall thickness, that's diagnostic of HCM. This particular septum is nearly three centimeters in diameter compared to this in, infralateral wall, it's thinner here. Here we see the mitral valve, and this is shown as the mitral valve is open in the, the part of the cardiac cycle that's called diastole. As the heart contracts during what's called systole, the mitral valve closes, the cavity gets smaller here, the LV cavity gets smaller, and you can see the anterior leaflet of this mitral valve hits the septum. And this, this happens again in about two thirds of the patients with HCM and leads to obstruction of blood flow out because blood is gonna come this way and out the aorta, there's obstruction of blood flow. And again, that often leads to symptoms in patients with HCM. Here's an example of Doppler echo echocardiography. So sort of like using radar, Doppler radar, but this time to image blood flow in the heart. You can see this bright red signal here, again, in the left ventricular outflow tract is indicative of a high gradient of a pressure gradient uh, due to the obstruction of the mitral valve hitting the septum. At the same time, there's this other flow back into the left atrium across the mitral valve. That's again, the leaky mitral valve or mitral regurgitation that often goes hand in hand with the outflow tract gradient in, in the two thirds of patients who have the obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. To measure the extent of the gradient, we use another uh, type of Doppler uh, echo, and uh, this uses the velocity of blood flow to estimate the pressure across the gradient, across the obstruction in the outflow tract. In this case, the, the gradient of, of, of pressure between the left ventricle and the uh, aortic valve is about 70 millimeters of mercury. That's a very high 
uh, gradient in the left ventricular outflow tract in this particular patient. Turning now to CMR, this is a standard, uh, what we call four chamber Cine CMR. Uh, let me start that movie again so you can see the, the moving pictures. Now the movie doesn't seem to want to play. Let me try one more time. There we go. This is a patient with uh, marked hypertrophy of their septum, as well as the apex. This is the left ventricle, the left atrium, the right ventricle, and the right atrium here, and the mitral valve is this thin structure here. So this is a patient with marked hypertrophy of the septum and apex that's very uh, beautifully demonstrated on cardiac MR. The image quality tends to be higher on cardiac MR than an echo, although echo usually is used to make the diagnosis. MR is uh, the gold standard for measuring the, the weight or mass of the left ventricle, the size, uh, the cavity in the left ventricle, and it can measure some of the things that echo measures, but echo measures the left ventricular outflow tract gradient and the extent of mitral regurgitation uh, best. But what CMR is really good at is identifying the different subtypes of cardiac, uh, of HCM. So this is from, uh, I'm a co-principal investigator of the largest comprehensive registry in, in HCM called HCMR, the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Registry, which is an NIH-funded uh, uh, registry. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But 2,755 patients with HCM were, were recruited between 2014 and 2017. We're still following these patients. We identified primarily six different morphologic subtypes of HCM by CMR. And these are the four chamber long axis images in these six different subtypes. So subtype A is a patient with what we called isolated basal septal hypertrophy, often associated with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Patient B has something, uh, the subtype called reverse septal curvature, where the thickest portion of the septum is not at the base, but in the middle of the septum. These two subtypes made up 80% of the patients in, in our study HCMR. Patient C is a patient with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the uh, thickening of the heart muscle is limited to the apex or front part of the heart. That was seen in about uh, uh, three to five percent of patients. Another few percent had this uh, concentric form of LVH. Concentric means uh, thickening of each wall. Every wall is thick symmetrically around the left ventricle. Patient E was again about another 3% of patients or so who have obstruction in the middle part of the ventricle as opposed to in the outflow tract. So the septum and the lateral wall hit here hit each other during contraction. And often these patients have these thin walled apical aneurysms as shown in this patient E. And then patient F was in a group of patients with well, only about 1% of patients that couldn't be uh, fit into any of the other groups. We call these other. And here's a patient with isolated thickening of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. But what CMR shows us that no other imaging technique is able to show is the presence of scar in the heart. So this is a technique called late gadolinium enhancement. What does that mean? We inject the standard uh, type of MRI contrast agent that's called gadolinium. We image 10 to 20 minutes later, normal heart muscles should appear black, such as in this patient who has no scar in the heart. Areas of scar show up as bright white. So this patient has extensive scar in the anterior or front wall of the heart, and then patchy scar here in the inferior portion of the septum. Patient C has the classic form of a scar in the heart in HCM, which is where right where the right ventricle inserts into the left ventricle in the septum, here in the outer wall of the heart, those two areas where the RV inserts into the LV. That's the most common site of scar in HCM for reasons that are not entirely clear. Patient E is another patient with similar scar. And then patient F is a patient with a very severe hypertrophy of their septum. And you can see this very diffuse, uh, a significant amount of scar in the heart. And we generally measure the amount of scar 
relative to the total mass or weight of the left ventricle of the heart. Again, scar, any scar, is generally seen in about half or a little more than half of HCM patients. Importantly, emerging data is suggesting that scar is a marker of uh, risk of fast heart rhythms or ventricular arrhythmias in HCM, and Pam Mason will speak more about that in a moment. As it turns out, in this study by Mar Marty Marin and colleagues from Tufts from about 1,100 patients, they showed that there's a stepwise increase in the risk of sudden cardiac death in patients who had no scar to a bit of scar, to a modest amount of scar, to a significant amount of scar. So the more scar that one has in the heart, in the heart with HCM, the higher the risk of sudden cardiac death. And that is translated into the updated 2020 ACC HA guidelines that were published uh, really just over a year ago. And where does imaging play a role in deciding on the use of an ICD or implantable cardioverter defibrillator in HCM? Well, imaging plays a role in a number of places. One of the indications for an ICD is massive LVH, meaning a septal thickness of 30 millimeters or greater that can be identified either by echo or CMR. The presence of an apical aneurysm, such as, as I showed you in patient E in the previous slide, ejection fraction less than 50%, and both of these can be shown by echo and or CMR. These are clear-cut indications for an ICD. The addition to the most recent guidelines is the presence of extensive late gadolinium enhancement on CMR. Can an ICD may be considered with that alone, but often this is seen in conjunction, conjunction with one of the other risk factors. And in discussions with one's uh, uh, cardiologist, one can help use this information in a discussion with your doctor about deciding on whether an ICD is right for you. Just a word about our uh, big study, HCMR, it was funded back in 2013 by the NHLBI. Uh, it's now funded by a combination of, of funds from Cytokinetics and a gift to the University of Virginia. This is our website. If you're interested in more uh, information, we're now in the follow-up phase. And the goal of this study was to change the existing paradigm in HCM by improving risk stratification, by collecting data not only on imaging with ECHO and CMR, but biomarkers as well as uh, um, uh, biomarkers as well as uh, clinical history. We're also uh, using the study to establish risk predictors to select patients for future, future clinical trials to prevent sudden cardiac death and heart failure, monitor treatment response, and help to design future studies. 44 sites uh, enrolled patients into, that, into the study, 22 in uh, four countries in, the U in uh, Europe, and 22 in US and Canada. You can see there was a Northeastern predilection. Again, patients were recruited between 2014, 2017. We recruited 2,755 patients. And it'll be another year or two before we can make conclusions about risk factors from the data collected in this study as to who's at increased risk for sudden cardiac death and or heart failure. So in summary, Imaging is an essential part of the diagnosis and therapeutic decision-making in HCM. Echocardiography is the imaging modality of first choice for making the diagnosis, for screening family members, for identifying obstruction to blood flow in the two-thirds of patients who have obstruction, identifying leaks in the, uh, the mitral valve. CMR is increasingly important and uh, likely should be done at, at the time of diagnosis or soon after diagnosis in, in each patient to identify the subtype, to identify the presence of scar and the amount of scar, which can enhance the ability to risk stratify in patients with HCM. With that, I'll end and happy to answer any questions. So to those who are unaware of what HCMR actually did beyond collecting a lot of the MRI data. It was the first modern attempt at really organizing our global HCM community, 
around one focal point. And that is not a small task. And Chris Kramer navigated it beautifully and brought in so many collaborators. And it really became kind of a starting point for more collaborative work throughout the entire HCM community. So I don't know that Chris would stand up and say, yeah, I did that. But he did that, and, and I know what he did, and I'm really impressed with it. So thank you for all of those efforts. Um, we do have a couple of quick questions here. And Benjamin's asking a great question. Is there any way to reduce scar? So that's, that's, that's a terrific question. Uh, there is no way uh, at the present time that we know of to reduce uh, the scar. Uh, there are the newer therapies in HCM. Uh, there's data using CMR with uh, Mavicampton that by reducing the outflow tract gradient, which Mavicampton does well and, and uh, likely Afficampton does uh, similarly, uh, that the overall mass of the heart muscle, the, the shrinks, that there's what we call reverse remodeling. So there's a reduction in the thickness of the septum and the overall uh, uh, mass of the, the heart muscle. And that's with 18 weeks of, of therapy. The, with those, with, with those uh, treatments, the amount of scar didn't change, but the uh, actual thickness of the muscle and the overall mass of the muscle uh, changed. These are, this was a small study, but very powerful using uh, CMR in, in, in about 35 patients uh, randomized to either uh, the, the novel uh, therapies or placebo. So there's a lot of hope for new therapies. And, uh, you know, if the optimist heard you say that, they, they heard Navicampton reduces scar. Um, we don't know that yet. There's some hope that there will be some remodeling of the heart. We have to wait and see. And I'm just putting a pin in that one just because I know a few people here are going to hear what they wanted to hear out of that, but we don't know yet. Um, Question leaning towards um, more echo imaging. What about the use of micro bubbles, micro beads, um, contrast agent to improve the imaging through echo? What, what tricks do we have up our sleeve? Yeah, so um, echo contrast using micro bubbles is useful in, in two ways uh, in HCM. Uh, the first is in some patients who have difficult images difficult imaging with echo, contrast can improve the overall image quality and improve the diagnostic uh, abilities of echo. But the second way, and Mike uh, Ragasta will likely uh, speak more about that, it's, it's used uh, in alcohol septal ablation, the microbubbles to identify the proper uh, arteries to treat uh, and uh, 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 occlude uh, to improve, um, the, reduce the outflow tract obstruction. And, and Mike can speak to that uh, during his talk. Tricky question. I'm going to um, uh, smooth out the question so it's not so specific to a patient. If someone had an MRI back in the 2005 through 2008-10 area with the technology that was available at that time, with the mapping that was available at that time, when that, with our understanding that was available at that time, and they opted to receive an ICD, or I'm sorry, a pacemaker at that time and not an ICD. Um, this person I, uh, may be pacer dependent for other reasons, let's just hypothesize. Um, would it be wise to get a new MRI today because there's some thoughts that maybe an ICD might be warranted for this individual. Is that time span enough to make a big difference in what you would expect to see in the MRI? So uh, a couple of points to, to point out. So in 2007, it wouldn't have been, once your pacemaker was placed, it wouldn't have been safe, considered safe to get an MRI of your heart. But the things have progressed very uh, significantly since then. And in the last several years, now many centers, including our own, very, uh, can safely image patients with uh, ICDs and uh, pacemakers, especially uh, now that the manufacturers make uh, MRI compatible devices, but even some non-MRI compatible devices can be uh, imaged safely 
if that the your institution that you're getting the study in has proper safety protocols and it knows how to do the procedure correctly. So certainly patients that now have pacers and ICDs at the proper institution with the proper protocols can be imaged safely. And so if one had an MRI in 2007, it's certainly possible that, and, and studies are uh, increasingly showing that some patients have some, not all, some patients have development of scar or progression of scar over time. So it would not be unreasonable to consider uh, an MRI 15 years later, uh, even with a, a pacemaker or ICD. In uh, again, I want to stress this: in an institution that knows how to do it and uh, has the the proper facilities and safety protocols. Excellent nuanced answer. Thank you very much. Um, do those with higher scar burden tend to go to transplant at any significantly different rate? So that, that's a great question. I, I don't think we have the answer to that. I think we will through HCMR, uh, although you know the, the number of transplants, I think even now, you know, mean follow-up of four years, I think we, we have about seven transplants. So whether we'll have the power to know that uh, with that, that few events, we'll have to see. But, but certainly patients with extensive scar tend to have not only higher incidence of sudden cardiac death, but probably a higher incidence of heart failure because of the, the scar and fibrosis and thickening and uh, inability of the heart to relax. So it's quite likely, although we, I, I wouldn't say there's hard data in that regard, I would say it's quite likely that patients with extensive scar tend to have more heart failure and uh, would then therefore uh, be at higher risk for ultimately needing transplant. I'll say that I have a, a tiny but unique collection of hearts here at the HCMA. We have uh, four in-house transplanted hearts that were donated to us by their former owners. And the scar burden in all of them, just by visualization of looking at that cavity, it's pretty impressive. They're, they're highly scarred hearts, including my own and Amy's. A um, lot of scar deep deep in the tissue and, in, and actually into the papillary muscles as well. So um, I think we'll find them probably more with high scar burden would land in the transplant pathway than elsewhere, but I don't necessarily know that it's an independent factor, but it's definitely interesting. Um, uh, Bruce, I'm trying to understand your question. Does pre or post myectomy make a difference? Um, so would you see a difference in scar burden or mass after a myectomy? Yes. Yeah, so uh, actually you, you don't see, so the uh, generally, uh, you know, myectomy removes tissue, so you don't see scar. Whereas uh, in alcohol septal ablation, one of the differences is the point of the procedure is to create scar. Uh, initially, there was some consideration. Well, would that in increase the risk of of uh, uh, sudden cardiac death, the fast heart, heart rhythms, it turns out that that's not a concern. So even though alcohol septal ablation creates scar, it's a different kind of scar that doesn't carry with it uh, the risk that scar due to the, the, the underlying disease has. Fantastic. Last question, and then we're going to get off to talk about subcutaneous ICDs. Um, what is the line in the sand in excessive scarring? Is it the 15%? Is it 14%? Where, where is it? Yeah, so, you know, it's, I think we're, we're still learning. The one study suggests that if it's more than, and, and, and the guidelines suggest in terms of uh, indication for ICD, it's a, what's called a 2B indication, meaning it's you, to consider, it doesn't mean you have to put in an ICD, but it's something to be considered. The cutoff is 15%. Um, so, but, but in terms of uh, additional data is really needed to, to fine tune and, and you know the the quantification of scar is 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 not an easy something that's done easily by CMR. I, I, don't, I don't so the difference between thirteen percent and seventeen percent it is probably not great. And so so in my mind, extensive is once it gets into that fifteen percent range, whether it's thirteen percent or more than you know eighteen percent or then we're talking extensive scar. So somewhere that, that exact number probably doesn't matter, but 
somewhere in that range of uh, around plus or minus two or three percent around the range of 15 percent. Thank you for that. And this is just kind of a public service announcement to publications. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of what's going on with Caremark, CVS, and Eloquist right now. It's called something called non-medical switching. But as we've been advocating on behalf of non-medical switching, which means an insurance company decides it's not going to cover Eloquist anymore, it's only going to cover Zeralto for an example, but that's actually what's happening. So that's called non-medical switching. It's turning out that PBMs and insurance companies are trying to read between the lines and guidelines. And if you say 15%, they're holding you to that to a ridiculous degree because they think it's going to save them money. So as we write collectively as a community, we must remember that the payers are not dealing with literature like they did 15, 20 years ago. They're looking for those spaces where they can say, eh, it doesn't say that exactly. So we must provide some coverage language in the future so that we're not putting our patients at additional risk because of bureaucracy. That said, um, subcutaneous ICDs and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Pamela Mason is going to present next. Pam, take it away. I think you're on mute. All right, I, hopefully I am unmuted here. You're unmuted. And I'm trying to get my slides to come up here. Yeah. All right, are you? You look good. All right, very good. Um, so thank you so much for uh, allowing me to participate in this program tonight. Um, obviously, we're all really excited about this and we're excited uh, to be part of um, you know, the, the Center of Excellence and the program uh, that we're doing tonight. So um, I am Pam Mason. I am the director of the electrophysiology group here at the University of Virginia. I love saying I'm an electrophysiologist because it makes me sound really smart and important, but basically that's just a fancy way of saying that I specialize in heart rhythm disorders. And as Dr. Ayers said so eloquently at the beginning, this is one of the important pillars of managing folks who have HCM. Um, I'm only going to be talking about one small part of the arrhythmia management uh, for patients with HCM because those folks are prone to getting several different heart rhythm abnormalities. But one of the most important things, and obviously there's been a lot said about this already, but one of the most important issues is that patients who have HCM have a risk of what we call sudden cardiac death. So there's a risk of patients developing lethal heart rhythm abnormalities. And on this slide, you can see pictures of two, sort of the two flavors of arrhythmias that cause sudden cardiac death. There's ventricular tachycardia, which is very fast um, and wide. And then there's ventricular fibrillation, which is very fast and very chaotic, as you can see, which is on the bottom. And what happens when patients go into these heart rhythm abnormalities is that basically their heart is, is beating so chaotically and fast. It's the same as their heart stopping because it doesn't have time to fill with blood and it can't move the blood forward. And if normal rhythm isn't restored, these patients can die. So if a patient would develop one of these rhythms, um, they usually get dizzy, lightheaded, pass out. And again, if we don't restore normal rhythm, then they can go on and die. Um, when we say restore normal rhythm, what we're usually talking about is defibrillation, which if we're in the rescue squad or in an emergency department, what we're talking about is being shocked, paddles on the chest, and we deliver a shock and that returns people to normal rhythm. Some patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have risk for sudden cardiac death. And for patients who have actually experienced sudden cardiac death and were fortunate to survive, we always offer these patients what we call uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillators, which is what I'm going to be talking about for, for most of my time. And even some patients who have not experienced sudden cardiac or death, um, we know that their risk is high enough that we will go ahead and offer them an implantable defibrillator to protect them because we know their risk is there. And um, this is really um, the intersection of all the different disciplines of, of cardiology. I am a heart rhythm specialist, but as has been said by multiple speakers before me, um, I'm really dependent on my imaging colleagues to really help us out and guide us to who is actually at risk for having sudden cardiac death. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going over the risk factors because I only have 15 minutes and I was going to talk specifically about defibrillators, but suffice it to say that there are a variety of important risk factors that we look at. Um, um, 
and patients with HCM should always talk to their physicians about their own personal risk of having sudden cardiac arrest. And your physician might choose to use a calculator um, similar to, to what is shown here. This is one produced by the American Heart Association. Um, looks at things like age, the left ventricular wall thickness, again, there's you know our, our intersection with imaging, left atrial size, also from imaging, our gradient across the obstruction, family history of sudden cardiac death, there's our, our, our genetic piece, um, uh, prior uh, non-sustained uh, episodes of the arrhythmias, unexplained passing out, lower heart function, uh, aneurysms, which are weaknesses in the walls, and then you can see here it says extensive LGE, which Dr. Kramer was just talking about. That's the manifestation on MRI of SCAR. So if we think that folks have enough risk of having sudden cardiac arrest, we will offer them a defibrillator. And right now we have sort of two general options that we can offer patients. Um, this is a chest X-ray. Um, so sort of one from the front and one from the side showing a transvenous implantable cardioverter defibrillator. You'll hear them called ICDs as well. We've been doing these kinds of devices for decades. They're really um, excellent devices that are low risk to implant and work very well. So the way we put these in patients is we make a two inch incision in the skin of the shoulder, usually the left shoulder, and we make a pocket under the skin for the generator to sit. And um, this is the generator and it is mostly a lithium battery. It also has some circuitry in it and software. And then there's a blood vessel that kind of goes up under the collarbone and then leads down to the heart. And that's how the wire gets into the heart. So that's why it's called a transvenous system. To get the wire into the heart, we're not cutting on the heart. We're actually just putting this whole device in through a two inch incision. We're doing these as outpatient procedures and letting folks go home the same day. Um, so they're very low risk to put in. And again, they work very well. And we've had great success with these devices. Devices, but there are a couple issues that we can see long-term with these devices. And this becomes very relevant for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population because compared to our other populations of patients who are getting these devices, our HCM patients tend to be younger. So one issue that can come up with these devices is that while the wires can last for years, we do start to see a demonstrable failure rate of these wires at about 10 years. So if you get your device when you're 85 years old, you know, that may not be a big issue, but if you get it when you're 25, it might be um, because these folks could be looking at having a lifetime of dealing with, you know, lead replacements. I think it goes without saying that we can't keep putting more and more leads in. Eventually we have to start taking them out. Um, and that can, um, add a little bit of risk um, and is another thing that tends to be done at specialized centers. We do do it at UVA. Another issue that uh, can be of concern with these sort, uh, forms of devices is these leads are in the bloodstream. And so if patients get infections, particularly bloodstream infections, the actual defibrillator can get infected. And whether it's a defibrillator or a hip replacement, if you have hardware in your body that gets infected, it's practically impossible to clear that infection without taking everything out, which again, you know, we're talking about taking out leads, which have potentially been in a patient for years and can get scarred into position and, you know, into position and don't want to come free easily. So about probably 10 to 15 years ago, um, they, um, this device was, was uh, developed. And this is called a subcutaneous defibrillator. And this was sort of designed in mind to try to deal with those issues that we can see with the transvenous systems. Um, it has the same components. It has a generator and a wire, but where they're located is differently. So the generator, rather than being um, at, under the skin up at the shoulder is actually at the side, the left side kind of below the armpit. And then there's still a wire, but the wire isn't actually going through a blood vessel or into the heart. If you look at this um, film from the side, you can see this lead is actually just under the skin. So subcutaneous means under the skin. So all components of this device are actually just under the skin, which means these issues of having to deal with these leads accumulating in the blood vessel or bloodstream infections just aren't there. And so these were really designed in my, thinking in mind for younger patients um, who may be dealing with having these devices uh, ahead of them for a lifetime. Um, these devices are also very low risk and easy to remove because again, everything is just under the skin. Now, one important limitation of these devices is that they cannot do any form of pacing. They cannot act as pacemakers. But again, if the patients are young and have no pacing needs, um, that might not be an issue for them. Um, now, when these devices were developed, um, many of us 
um, actually the first population that we thought about extensively was the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population. And there's two reasons. One, again, these patients tend to be young, which makes this device appealing. But the other thing that we were more concerned about is that there is a, some concern with these subcutaneous devices of what we call T-wave oversensing. And so this is a little bit of a, a, a busy figure, um, but this is an old school way that we used to screen um, for what we call T-wave oversensing. So if you look in panel C on this slide, um, you can see um, this is one heartbeat. So this really spiky waveform at the beginning is called a QRS complex. Um, and that is the depolarization of the heart. And then we have what we call a T wave, and that is the repolarization. But collectively, that's one heartbeat. So we want this device to be able to see that as one heartbeat. So if you think about it, a transvenous defibrillator, uh, the lead is directly in the heart. It's measuring the electrical signals in the heart. For this subcutaneous defibrillator, it's actually measuring something more akin to a surface EKG, right? So it has to, it's sort of an indirect measurement. So it has to be able to see this and identify it as one heartbeat. Um, so in panel C here, uh, this blue shaded area, you can see this whole thing fits nicely into the template. So this would have been considered a screen in. If you look at panel B, you can see this T wave is well outside of, of the shaded area. And so the device might not be able to tell the difference between this QRS or this T wave and think it's two separate heartbeats. If that happens, we call it double counting. Um, it's a form of T wave over sensing. And if that happens, the patient could get shocked because the defibrillator will think that their heart rate is twice what it actually is. So here is an example. This is um, actually from a, a subcutaneous ICD. Um, it's uh, got some age on it now, back to 2011. Um, but what you can see here at the top is you can see we have our QRS complex with the T wave and it's appropriately labeled in this top row. You can see there's a lot of S's which stands for sensing. But when you look in the second row, you see these T's. And if you look at where they're landing, you can see there's um, QRSs with a T under it. You can see uh, T waves with a T under it. And T stands for tachycardia, which means this device is starting to become concerned that this is an, a lethal arrhythmia. So this is an example of T wave over sensing. Um, and it, 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 and um, it's causing double counting, basically. So the reason this got our attention for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population is patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have lots of voltage uh, because of the increased uh, mass. Um, and they also tend to get T wave anomalies and they tend to get uh, quite large T waves. So this is an ECG from a patient with HCM. Um, again, you can see this really big voltage on the QRS, but also these really large T waves. And so we very much worried that this, this the, this device was not going to be good for HCM patients, that there would be too much risk for um, T wave over sound sensing and double counting. So now we have some studies and we have some time and space from when these devices were first introduced about 10 years ago. And actually overall for the HCM population, it's been fairly reassuring. So what our studies have shown is the screening failure rate is low. We don't do screening with those little templates I was showing you anymore. We do it in an, in an automated way. Um, but the screening failure rate is low. It's not zero, but frankly, it's not zero in any population. Uh, when we test these devices at implant, they work very well. The success, the success rate during the follow-up is extremely high. And actually the rate of inappropriate shocks from T-wave over sensing is pretty low. It's a little bit higher than the transvenous systems, but it's still fairly low. So just to kind of review the pros and the cons of the two different systems. So for the transvenous defibrillators, pro, highly effective. Actually, these devices are really incredible. They are greater than 99% effective in, in restoring normal rhythm for patients who have sudden cardiac death. They've been around for a while. They have pacing capability. And one important point is not only can they do basic pacing, they can pace to treat the lethal arrhythmias. So particularly the ventricular tachycardia, which is regular, these devices can sometimes pace the patient out of the rhythm, which obviously is preferable to getting a shock. Uh, they have better T-wave discrimination, and then they have diagnostics. So they do a lot of storage. They'll store a atrial fibrillation. Um, they will actually measure the patient's volume status. Um, cons, again, as I already said, long-term lead issues, concerns of infection, and then challenges with lead removal or upgrade. When we talk about the subcutaneous defibrillators, pro, 
highly effective, um, less risk of systemic infection, uh, less risk of lead fracture, and very low risk if we ever do need or want to remove it. The con, as discussed, not everybody qualifies. Uh, no pacing capability of any kind, and it doesn't have that, that arrhythmia storage or heart failure diagnostics. And then, of course, it's not super high, but there is a small risk of the T wave oversensing. So in conclusion, both transvenous and subcutaneous ICDs, highly effective for prevention of sudden cardiac death in patients with HCM, with an overall low risk of complications, advantages and disadvantages of both systems. And so patients should really discuss, first and foremost, their risk of having sudden cardiac death with their physician, but also the benefits of each system. And I'm happy to stop there and take questions. Thank you very much for a complicated issue made simpler. <laughs> Um, so. <laughs> yeah, well, electrophysiology, as soon, as soon as you say the word, people are looking at you with, you know, questionable face, what does that mean? Um, but once you pronounce electrophysiologist, you can just throw it into sentences and just make yourself sound that much more intelligent. <laughs> so I think I'm going to ask a basic, basic question for the purpose of helping to educate our audience. We mentioned T waves a lot. Could you please explain what the T wave represents? So um, the T wave is the repolarization of the heart. So the QRS complex, um, so the big spike before that repolarization is the depolarization. Um, so that's the depolarization of the ventricle and the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricle. So it's together, they're one heartbeat. And that's why the device has to be able to identify those clearly as being one heartbeat. So my daughter was a victim of T wave oversensing that required, um, mm. that ended in a shock, an inappropriate shock from, from the episode. So I'm, I'm personally very aware of T wave oversensing and what we've learned by it, but we, we progress and we learn and technology catches up. So it doesn't act on a T wave oversense quite as easily mm -hmm. with most devices today. Um, okay. So Lorelai is asking, what percentage of people have the, the T-wave thing happening? Uh, how common is T-wave oversensing today? Um, there was a fairly recent study in the Heart Rhythm Journal, and um, I think in that study, it was around 5% with the subcutaneous ICD. So it's not nothing. Um, now, the transvenous systems, it's not zero either. I don't know what kind of device your daughter had, um, but it's, it's not that this is not a potential issue with that device as well. One thing that's really important is what you said before, which is these device technologies are evolving rapidly and are improving all the time. We tend to focus a lot on the actual hardware. We tend to focus on the components, but the truth of the matter is the major advances in these devices are actually in the software. The algorithms that these devices use to distinguish what is atrial fibrillation, what is T waves, are, it's really improved dramatically just over the last decade, um, and they continue to improve all the time and will continue to do so. Leadless devices, yeah. when are they coming? Uh, the, uh, leadless pacemakers are here and have been here. Um, what we don't have is leadless defibrillators, <laughs> um, but pacing capability is here in prime time. Now, one thing, um, and I'm guessing this might be what this question is directed at, um, the current uh, leadless pacemaker we have is manufactured by Medtronic. The subcutaneous ICD is manufactured by Boston Scientific. Boston Scientific is in process of developing their own leadless pacemaker. And supposedly, I understand that the subcutaneous ICD has already been engineered to talk to the leadless pacemaker. And so the idea is that issue that I was saying that the subcutaneous ICD can't do the pacing uh, to terminate the lethal arrhythmias the way a transvenous system uh, can. If that SICD can talk to its leadless pacemaker, then it might be able to actually do that therapy. And my understanding is that's what they're hoping it will do when it comes to market. It's in trials now. <clears throat> it's in trials. I, um, I'm going to throw some of my pessimism into this one. If we're trying not to implant things in the heart, why don't you stick with what's tried and true rather than trying to play with two devices that you're going to require them to talk to each other. So I hold out a little bit of skepticism on the functionality long term of that, but I hope I am uh, corrected with technology being far better than my imagination. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen good things. I've seen bad things. It sounds great on paper, but I'm like, eh, it's a lot of it's a lot of technology talking inside of your body kind of mm -hmm. constantly. 
Um, so if somebody's had infectious endocarditis, are there any options for non, um, uh, I really know, uh, uh, non-transverse uh, pacemakers? So I guess the, the leadless device, but you still have the risk of endocarditis infecting the unit. So the leadless pacemaker, um, we believed, and now there's actually data to show that they probably are less likely to get infected compared to a transvenous system. The reason is they're so small, they're implanted directly into the trabeculae, and so it endo endothelializes completely. So actually, we do think that a leadless pacemaker is less likely to get infected. And we have had patients who have had recurrent endocarditis that we have done some creative things like put in a leadless pacemaker and a subcutaneous. ICD. It's a lot of stuff going on in there. Um, okay, Kimmy is asking, what is the likelihood of a transvenous internal defibrillator becoming deactivated and not working when needed? Um, very low is, is the short answer. Um, the the device failure rate is not zero, right? These are, they are devices. They're very heavily regulated. There's lots of quality control, but it, it is, it, it's not zero. Um, the bigger issue we see as opposed to these devices just failing altogether is they're really smart, but they do what they're told, right? And so all of these things, like when you get treatment for ventricular tachycardia, you know, we are programming in specified rates where it starts to look. So if I tell a device, um, start thinking that this might be an arrhythmia at a heart rate of 200, but a patient has ventricular tachycardia at a rate of 190, the device isn't going to do anything, right? And so the bigger issue, and this is part of the reason why, um, you know, putting these devices in requires some skill, but everybody forgets that monitoring them, following them, programming them appropriately is actually arguably takes more skill. Um, and is part of the reason why, you know, we really like to have these folks in a, in a good center. So case study, N of one, um, the one, April Fool's Day, 2020, or 2001, I went to get my ICD check. I had ordered sushi, so I was going to pick it up on the way back from the doctor's office. I never picked up my sushi because when I went to get my device checked, they said, it's, it's nothing in there and it's April Fool's Day. And I'm like, you guys are funny. And they're like, no, it's not on. I'm like, what are you talking about? So my device had failed and I was unaware of it. I had a solder break in the wire. And because I went for my regular check, it had probably been broken for about two weeks. They found it, they replaced it. I got a new device, no, no harm, no foul. But if I was not a diligent patient and I was putting off my ICD check, it could have been left in a, in a very dangerous state for a very long period of time. So I think patients need a little bit of a reminder sometimes that we are a partner in this process. We can't depend solely upon the device, solely upon our doctor. We have a role here, and that role is to be a compliant patient, understand what you're signing up for, and take your responsibility seriously. If you're not going to take responsibility for it, don't get it, because it's only going to cause problems down the road. So make sure you know what you're getting into, and it's not that onerous. You mm -hmm. go and you, you follow the rules, and now, excuse me, now with the telemetry units like they are, mm -hmm. I'm talking 20 years ago, this is when mine happened. They tell you and they talk to the doctor and say, there's a problem here. We're not communicating <clears throat> and you'll get notified with the newer devices, but you yeah, still have to answer the call when the doctor's office calls. And so we have a problem here. Yeah. So, and I was just, I was just going to say that in this day and age, if you had that kind of problem with your device, you wouldn't have had to wait to go in to get your device checked. It, there's a remote monitoring box sitting on your bedside table that would have told us and we would have called you. Um, so, you know, again, you know, another major advance in is remote monitoring. Okay. So the bedside table thing doesn't work for a lot of us. We put it under the bed so you don't have to see it all. That's fine too. Uh, we now have phone apps for some of the newer defibrillators as well, that which patients really like because you can really be a partner and see your own data. About 15 years ago, I went to the innovation jam for Medtronic and they said, tell us what you dream of. I designed a, a watch that looks very much actually like my current Fitbit <laughs> that spoke to my device and that you could check everything on your watch and now it's actually coming to fruition and I'm not getting a dime for it, just saying. Um, but I'm happy that they created the technology. Um, how many SICD fails uh, because of the T-wave pattern? Well, the so risk with, 
Yeah. So, so the risk with the T wave over sensing is, is actually that you're going to get inappropriate shocks. And again, this is a, a, an aspect of the device can be working totally fine, right? That's actually not the device not working. It's we didn't choose a patient who was a good candidate or we don't have it programmed correctly. Um, and so, you know, with appropriate screening, the failure rate, the, the, the inappropriate um, shock issue should be low. And a couple of questions about lead integrity and lead um, life spans. Mm -hmm. um, I know many people who have leads that are 20, 25 years old mm -hmm. functioning just fine. Um, when did they just not work anymore? And when do you have to remove versus replace? Yeah. So, um, which if you look sort of across the board and obviously there's differences in the different manufacturers leads, but starting at about 10 years, we start to see a significant fall off in the longevity of the leads. So somewhere around, you know, 20% of the leads start to fail around 20 years. So that's not insignificant. And that's part of the reason going to what you said, we've got to follow these patients really closely, right? And every time a patient gets a, a defibrillator check, we check three parameters on the lead, its ability to capture the heart, its ability to sense an impedance or resistance, which is the, you know, that's a physics term, right? It's a measure of the integrity of the lead. And if we see changes in that, um, mm -hmm. then, then, then we start to get concerned. So do we see defibrillator leads that are still working fine at 20 years? Yeah. Is it, you know, super common? Less so, right? And we, we start to get concerned about those and monitor them really closely. Um, whether or not to leave them in or take them out, um, this is a huge area of that's really important for a shared decision making between a provider and a patient, because there's a lot of reasons one might choose to do one or, or, or the other. Um, if you look at our guidelines, um, the guidelines come down hard and say you should never have more than, than four leads through a blood vessel. Okay. And that can be an issue because the, the pictures that I was showing were of what we call single lead defibrillators, mm -hmm. but some people actually need full pacing capability. Um, and they may have already two or three leads in place. So we can't just keep adding leads and adding leads. At some point we have to start taking them out. Um, age, I think is quite relevant as well. If we have a patient who is 25 years old and they get a transvenous system and it fails when they're 35, maybe they have a single lead device and you could say, well, there's only one lead in there, we could abandon it. But again, if we're thinking this person is going to be dealing potentially with a lifetime of this, and we can't just keep adding more leads, that's a really important discussion for the patient to have um, with, with their physician and, and really decide what's best for them. Um, it's important to note lead extraction. Um, it's, it's not a super high risk thing to do at all. If you actually look at the complication rates and the risk of having a major event, it's actually low but it's low if you're at a specialized center. This is really something that should not be just done anywhere. Um, we are a center at UVA, we do do lead extractions. Um, and this is again, similar to HCM care, a very you know, sort of multidisciplinary feel. We do our high risk extractions with surgery backup. We have cardiac anesthesia. We have you know, all the things that we, we would you know, need available should we have any problems. I would say it's probably one of the areas that <clears throat> even if you're at an HCM, a recognized center of excellence, if they do not have high lead extraction experience, go elsewhere. It's, <clears throat> it's critically important. Most of our programs have pretty good pro programming for lead extraction, but some of them, it, they just don't have the volume. So it's really important that you go to high, high volume. Um, okay, so we answered the lead dependence issues. One last question on activity in HCM, and then we'll hold the rest till the end of the session. Um, how active can you be with an ICD subcutaneous or transvenous? Um, so one of the advantages to the, the subcutaneous device is because it's just under the skin, um, everything is anchored. So people are pretty cleared for any and all activities um, for, um, you know, pretty, pretty quickly after the device goes in and then long-term. With the transvenous systems, um, we don't restrict activity solely based upon having the defibrillator um, because that blood vessel is kind of where the pectoral muscle is. You know, if you look at the patients who has lead, mm -hmm. leads break, it does tend to be our young male patients, especially if they're very active and doing sports. Um, so we don't formally restrict people from activity. You know, I do counsel my patients, especially the younger, more active ones, that their, their risk probably is a little bit higher if they have a transvenous system. Um, um, but we also, lifestyle is important, um, as has already been said. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that comprehensive overview and some details in there. And I'm sure there's going to be a few more questions in the closing session. Uh, for those of you who are following us on Facebook, we are not answering questions on Facebook. You have to come join the Zoom room and you can go to 4hcm.org, go to the calendar, sign up, and you can get a link right away and join us for the end of this session. We are going to do two more, one more session and a couple of Q&A, and then we're going to stop streaming on Facebook. So if you want to hear anything else, you're going to have to join us. Okay, next up, interventional therapy for obstruction. The, the big Mac Daddy question that people wonder, alcohol ablation versus myectomy, what do I do for obstruction? We're going to bring in Michael and John, and you. Guys, I don't know who's doing your screen share first, so you guys can. So I got, I'm going to run them. We're going to do this um, kind of back and forth. And so Great. can everybody see the screen? Let me, can you all see that? You are now in present mode. Go ahead. All right. Excellent. Yeah. So we thought we'd do this kind of like how we do clinical practice, which is the heart team approach and kind of show you how that how that works. Um, and one thing I can say, first of all, this has been a really great conference. Thanks for putting it together. And, I'm, I, uh, and we really do have a great team at UVA and you can, you can just hearing all these talks together really kind of solidifies that. I think it's, we, we have such great colleagues to work with. Uh, and John and I work closely on these. And I can tell you, this, these are some of the hardest decisions we make in our, uh, in our work every day is, is what do we do? Septal ablation or myectomy or just keep going with medicines? And that decision is so important because that's really a defining uh, point in a person with uh, HCM's life is, is the procedure. And getting that right is very important to us. Um, so a couple of points to make is that the indications for these procedures are really the same, whether you're doing a myectomy or an alcohol septal ablation, they're, they're the same indications. And it means you have severe symptoms on as much medicine as you're able to tolerate properly. You have to have a thick septum as, uh, as you heard earlier by Dr. Kramer, 1.5 centimeters is kind of the number we're looking for. Um, there should be obstruction also, and it should be severe obstruction. Uh, and this 50 millimeters is kind of the cutoff value that we like to see, whether it's at rest or when you provoke it with either exercise or some other maneuvers. And this is what uh, Chris Kramer showed earlier is this is the mechanism of the obstruction is this systolic anterior motion that mitral valves, we want to see that because if you got that and you got a lot of obstruction and you got a thick septum and you're not tolerating medicines very well, then you're going to benefit uh, very, very nicely from one of these procedures. Now, how do we figure that out? And we'll, we'll talk about that. So again, the other point I want to make is that this is the world of patients with HCM, but not everybody is symptomatic. So there's a small subset of patients who are symptomatic. And of those patients, there's a small set of patients who fail medical therapy and therefore need to have these more invasive uh, and aggressive procedures. And then the point I'd like to make in terms of alcohol septal ablation is not everybody is a candidate for alcohol septal ablation. They have to have suitable anatomy. We'll talk some about that as well. So I think, whoops, uh, sorry. Um, what is the ideal patient for septal ablation? And then John's going to tell you what the ideal patient for him is. But you know, we tend to like to do these in older folks that are at higher risk for surgery. And since the main risk of this procedure is need for a pacemaker, it's about roughly 10% of the patients will get a pacemaker as a consequence of an alcohol septal ablation. If they already have one, that makes them actually a very attractive candidate. And then I'll spend a little time during this talk talking about what's the ideal septal anatomy because this is something you're born with. Uh, we can't modify that. And this is going to determine the outcome of the procedure. And if the septal anatomy is ideal, then we're going to have something good to offer. That's the less invasive approach. I want to show you a patient. Um, John and I saw, we came up with a decision. We'll, we'll kind of take you through this. This was a 74 year old woman. She's had known hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, had been fairly controlled but then develop progressive symptoms uh, that were getting to the point where she, class three means pretty disabling. She could only walk about 20 yards before she had to stop and rest. And she was very short of breath as her main symptom, some lightheadedness and almost passing out. She was on as much medicine as she could take. 
And she did have um, not so much at rest, but when she did a Valsalva maneuver, she had a lot of obstruction. And she had some other medical problems. The primary one was some arthritis and knee replacements. And she wasn't very ambulatory because of that. So I had a little trouble getting around. Uh, and of course, that's something John's going to comment about recovery from, from surgery. It was going to be a little limited by that. Um, we always look at the EKG and she's got some conduction disease, a right bundle branch block, which gets my attention a little bit as far as is she can have a higher risk of pacer. Well, it turns out actually it's higher if you got a left bundle branch block, but she does have conduction disease. And so we're going to be concerned about her being a higher risk of a pacemaker with a septal ablation. I couldn't actually tell how thick her septum was on the echo. It wasn't the best quality echo because of her body habitus. And so we did an MRI and it clearly showed a septum that was 23 um, millimeters. We did a heart catheterization on her. She had normal coronary, so there's no obstruction. And then this is what I'm looking for to consider septal ablation. This is the left anterior descending artery here. And that's a normal, healthy vessel. These are the septal perforators, these little things. These are supplying the septum with blood. And in her, she had two. She had this one that's a little far down. This one looks like a really good one for us to consider septal ablation. It's in the right place. Uh, and so looking at this, at this angiogram, I felt like, well, she's, that's an option for her. Uh, she had seen John and, um, and myself, and I think I want to just open up to John's thoughts about a patient like this and, you know, myectomy. Well, what, what do you think, John? Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll touch on these a little bit later in terms of what is uh, the ideal candidate for surgical myectomy. And um, in this day and age, when we're talking about, you know, major invasive operation like open heart surgery, uh, one of the things we look at is what is this patient's ability to, to, to recover from heart surgery? And, um, you know, when you're talking about someone like you just presented, we got together and um, we, we take everything into consideration. And so if they have great anatomy for a, a septal ablation procedure and they have some uh, barriers which may limit their ability to bounce back from heart surgery, then something like this is a very straightforward uh, situation in which we say, hey, um, you know, why don't we strongly consider alcohol ablation for this? With the caveat knowing that, you know, one procedure does not uh, 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 prohibit uh, the option for the other procedure down the road. And so, again, the nice thing uh, about coming to a comprehensive center like this is, is uh, you know, you really have uh, input from everyone. We talk to one, to one another and, um, and we, in addition to just looking at the immediate options, we say, okay, well, what are the options down the road? Uh, should this not uh, necessarily work out the way we want it to work out? So after that discussion, we offered her the alcohol septal ablation. I just want to show you what it looks like. Uh, this is obstruction from the point of view of a catheterization doctor. So what you're seeing here is this is a scale from zero. This is 100 millimeters of mercury. This is up to here is 200 millimeters of mercury. So this is a pressure tracing and, and, you, and we measure simultaneously the pressure in the left ventricle and the pressure in the aorta. So that's gonna show us what our degree of obstruction is. And normally the left ventricle tracing and the aortic pressure tracing should be exactly the same in terms of how high the pressure gets. They should be identical. When there's obstruction, then the left ventricle is gonna be higher than the aortic pressure. The degree of, of obstruction means, you know, the more that difference is, the worse the obstruction. And what you can see here is, look at this one, huge pressure gradients, over hundred millimeters of mercury. Uh, and, and it's dynamic. This is pretty typical for HCM as it can vary even beat to beat. Um, but even at rest, she's showing us a lot of obstruction. And then after a premature ventricular contraction, that's like an, uh, you know, kind of a, a hyper contractile beat. That beat is stronger. You can see the gradient goes way up. So a lot of obstruction at baseline. This is how we do the procedure. We have uh, actually a temporary pacemaker in place in her, which 
can't see in here. Um, but this is the catheter in the ventricle. This is a little wire is down that little, that first septal I showed you. Uh, and then this is the balloon. We inflate a balloon in that vessel. And a lot of times we'll actually, while we're, we're doing that, we're measuring this pressure. You can actually see the pressure gradient already start to go away just with the balloon inflated. When we see that, we're like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get this. This, this is going to get a good result. We also do contrast echo. I think somebody had asked earlier, what's the role of contrast echo? And this is it. Uh, we inject contrast down, we take the wire out, inject the contrast down this, this catheter. And we look and see what's lighting up. And if it's the place on the septum where the obstruction is, then we know when we inject the alcohol, that's where it's gonna go and it will take out the obstruction. And in this woman, uh, that's what happened. Uh, we injected the alcohol and we made the obstruction dramatically better. It's not gone. And I think this is something maybe John would like to address. I think, and, and I'll be the first to admit that myectomy is probably better at eliminating obstruction. Septal ablation, we are limited by the anatomy. And so we got rid of a lot of it. And the, the hope is that she's gonna feel a lot better with the reduction in obstruction, but we've not eliminated it. Now, another point to make is over time, this obstruction can get less after septal ablation. And often you may see the peak effect months later as some of the hypertrophy regresses because you've gotten rid of some of the obstruction, some of the component of the LVH actually regresses. So you will see this sometimes get better. But John, you want to comment on, on how good myectomy is at eliminate obstruction yeah. compared to septal ablation? Yeah, I, I think that gets in a little bit to, you know, what we're going to talk about in terms of the ideal candidate for septal myectomy. And, you know, I, I think if you got someone with really severe, you know, basal or hypertrophy, um, uh, we, we can really end up with a, a great result. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit too, that we can't always get those gradients uh, down to zero, uh, but we don't necessarily need to, you know, uh, um, again, for folks uh, with um, basal or hypertrophy and significant uh, systolic anterior motion and uh, the leakiness of the mitral valves contributing to the pathology, uh, if we can get rid of that pathology, they're going to feel a whole lot better and, 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 and do very well. You know, we got, we got to remember, it's interesting, you know, if you look at the history of this, to some extent, um, before alcohol septal ablation and before perfecting the, the techniques of uh, a septal myectomy, uh, a treatment for this was mitral valve replacement, because if you give them a competent mitral valve and they no longer have the leaky mitral valve, Yes, they have this gradient, but they, but they don't have that obstructive component to it. Yeah, thanks. This is the angiogram after we do the septal ablation. And what you'll see is that septal perforator, that vessel is gone. So they disappear when you, when you do inject alcohol down. That, and that's okay. We want to see that. So John, why don't you tell us about what you think is yeah. the ideal myotomy yeah. patient? Right. So, um, you know, as you alluded to, uh, we kind of look at those folks who are younger in age, and there's many reasons for that. And the, the foremost is uh, the ability to bounce back quickly from a major invasive operation. Um, you know, we don't want to uh, cure a, a single pathology, but then, you know, uh, upset the apple cart in doing so. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, those folks with uh, focal basal or uh, hypertrophy do well, but you know we see the variants, the the mid cavity and the apicals, and you know that may get into a little bit of a different algorithm. Um, just like you, folks who already come to us with pacemakers, ICDs, you know we can be a little bit more aggressive uh, in in removing some of that uh, septum. Um, and it's interesting because the area that we remove surgically, it's highlighted there on the left. And again, that's got kind of like the classic scenario. Um, you see the, the, the basal component of that hypertrophy and we shave that off. Um, but those folks who already have pacemakers, we can be a little bit more aggressive circumferentially in that LV outflow track and really, really alleviate the, the obstruction. 
And then the interesting thing, and this is what I wanted to just kind of mention that it's so important to go to a comprehensive center that has everyone, everyone you've taught, you've heard from uh, before. Um, you know, I'm fortunate. I'm kind of at the end of the line when folks get to me, they've already seen everyone else. And, and, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's a blessing for me, but uh, you know, those folks who may have concomitant heart conditions and, you know, how does that play in? Uh, kind of looking at it two ways. And when I say concomitant heart conditions, people who may have coronary artery disease, blocked heart arteries, uh, or their leaky mitral valve might be due to the fact that the mitral valve itself is abnormal. Um, you know, how are they best served? Sometimes uh, it's best to take care of all those things surgically. Look, no one wants to have heart surgery. I get it, you know? I've been doing this for 35 years. No one wants to have heart surgery. But sometimes it's the best way to take care of all these things, recognizing that, you know, if you add procedure on top of procedure, it does increase the risk. So again, being at a place like, like this, you know, then you start talking about, you know, what are the potential for hybrid procedures saying, well, we can take care of this surgically. And then, you know, Mike can come in and can do something, you know, catheter based. And so I think it's, it, it's uh, again, highlights and emphasizes the heart team approach. I think we have a, a nice patient we both saw that um, uh, I can present a little bit. I saw her first. Um, she's only 30 and she's got known hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very strong um, family history. She had sudden cardiac death in her family. Um, and she had an ICD place for unexplained syncope, uh, very thick septum, severe obstruction, and remarkably symptomatic, yet she was, you know, taking care of little kids and, and trying to work, but was profoundly dysmic and would have syncope uh, very frequently. And she was on maximal medical therapy. Um, healthy, healthy lady. So this and is one that was not going to, uh, I wasn't going to spend more than two seconds telling her that septal ablation was not for her, that she needed to see John. So. Yeah. And you know, so this is, and, and, and we'll see in the next image, you know, for us, kind of like the thicker the septum, the better, because then, you know, it's, yeah, I know the definite, you know, septum greater than 1.5. It's interesting when we do these operations, we go in and we think that we're really, you know, cutting out a lot of septal muscle and we get it all out and we look at the specimen afterwards and we're like, oh my goodness, it looks like a pea. Um, you know, but when you got someone who's, who's got a septum that's three centimeters, we know we got yeah, we, we got a lot of freedom in there to do a lot of good. And so, so you know, I just want you heard about the imaging and everything is important to us. Preoperative MRs, uh, it's not uncommon to get if you, you know, even, may it, the, even though it may not add to the diagnosis of HCM, we often get CAT scans ahead of time uh, to help with our surgical planning. But the intraoperative transesophageal echo, so once you're asleep, the echo probe is put down the food pipe. We get a good image of the heart from the backside of the heart. We can really see everything. And this really guides what we're going to do. And these are just some images of this patient um, with her uh, intraoperative but pre-myectomy uh, uh, echo. And so those arrows highlight some things you've seen before. On the upper left there, uh, you see <clears throat> those arrows pointing to the LV outflow tract and particularly that mitral valve, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve might may wanna highlight with this cursor, just going over, look at that, it's totally obstructing the outflow of that yeah. LV. Um, and you see it to a lesser degree to, that, uh, to the image on the right there. Um, and again, so all those images are, are highlighting that. The image on the bottom and you can't see it so well, but what we do in the operating room, we already knew that this woman's uh, septum was roughly three centimeters thick, but what we do in the operating room is, you know, once they're asleep, we get put the echo in, we make our measurements. We kind of see where the septum is maximally thick. We see where underneath the aortic valve, we're gonna start our incision or our cut, and we wanna see how long in, how deep or how long we want it to be. And generally, generally, this works out to be, um, we wanna excise a specimen that's a centimeter and a half. Uh, again, if someone's got a three centimeter septum, we want it to be a centimeter and a half to two centimeters thick. We want it to be about four centimeters long and we want it to be about two to two and a half centimeters wide. And, you know, that may sound like a lot. Uh, it, 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 
it's variable. But again, if someone's septum is only a centimeter and a half or, or 18 millimeters thick, you know, we're not going to be going uh, a centimeter and a half deep into that septum. So it's really important we look at that echo before surgery. So the next slide shows um, this, is, this is after surgery. So I think you can already see there on the left, you see how wide open that LV outflow tract is, that uh, anterior, the, the mitral valve uh, is closing normally. There's, there's no anterior motion of that uh, anterior leaflet um, and it's shown there. And then the next slide uh, just shows uh, both um, sort of literally side by side, the preoperative and the after the septal myectomy and you see a dramatic difference. And maybe Mike can comment on, I included <laughs> the, the EKG. So this is a pretty aggressive myectomy uh, and a pretty darn good result. And uh, in, the, in the status post myectomy slide there, there's the EKG. What do you see on that, Mike? It's got a bundle. Uh, she but, does, but, and we're first okay that. but conduction is intact. But conduction is intact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We almost always leave with a bundle like that. Yeah. It's not uncommon um, to come out of the operating room. Um, we, we always put temporary pacing wires on and it's not uncommon at all to need to be paced for the first day or two. Um, but usually conduction comes back uh, by the third, fourth day. Yeah, that's a beautiful result. And I, I can say, um, you know, John's an artist. I mean, th and this is an art uh, and doing a proper myectomy really requires somebody with a lot of experience to know exactly how much to shave. I mean, he's, and John really is an artist at, at this and, and does a beautiful work with, uh, with some of these patients. So we're very fortunate to have him on our team. Um, I think uh, the next one I wanna show you is, uh, is somebody who was sent to me as ideal for septal ablation. Um, and what I'll show you is she was not, and we ended up doing an operation on her. And uh, so this woman was 66. She's actually reasonably healthy. She's got some medical problems, was followed for HCM and had, uh, again, severe obstruction, severely symptomatic, had about 2.4 centimeters of, uh, of thick septum. And I did her heart cath to see what her anatomy was. And this is what I saw. And what I'm gonna show you here is again, here's the left anterior descending artery. She does not have any coronary disease. That's a healthy artery. This is the septal perforator that I would normally want to use. And it's a tiny little thing. It's very, very small. Uh, it's unlikely uh, to be, uh, to do any good if I inject alcohol down that, that I would, give her, you know, some inf uh, infarction, but it would unlikely to address the obstruction. If you look here, she's got another septal perforator that's way down here. This is too far to account for the obstruction, which is typically at this level. It's kind of high up where that, near that mitral valve. Um, and actually what's interesting, you can see how it compresses. So there's got a lot of hypertrophy, so that vessel's compressing. But I was very disappointed when I saw this and she was just more disappointed because what I told her is I really didn't think that septal ablation was in her interest. Uh, again, she didn't want an operation, but I sent her to John and, and John saw her. Maybe you can uh, make some comments about, she hasn't had her surgery yet, but. Um, yeah, she hasn't. She's, she's had some things come up. Um, which uh, it's been a, a, a start and stop sort of thing, but again, just you know, seeing that uh, the coronary anatomy and that septal anatomy, she's, um, you know, uh, 66 is not that old. <laughs> so uh, trust me on that one. And so, you know, I, she, she, she's got, yeah, we have, you know, you heard me say earlier that the optimal, you know, surgical patient, you know, young recover from, but not, look, some folks need surgery and they're still going to have those barriers that we're going to have to overcome. And, and again, we're blessed at UVA, in addition to everyone you've heard from tonight, um, our physical therapists, our occupational therapists, you know, we have this whole program in place where our physical therapists see these patients preoperatively, they assess them, they give them some exercises to work on, and we do everything we can. This is the big topic in any surgery these days is prehab. And so we're very much into that at UVA right now. And that's a big deal, particularly when it comes to 
uh, to folks like this. You know, a lot of these folks come to us deconditioned and they they need a little bit of reconditioning ahead of time and it can really help the post-op recovery. So, so uh, yeah, we're, we're still waiting, uh, but hopefully she's going to do fine. Yeah. I just want to make a couple of comments on the septal anatomy because, again, this is how we decide a lot of these folks. And it varies widely. You can see in this particular patient, one, two, three, four, multiple septals. Which one is the one you're going to use? This is another patient here, which had, again, an array of septals. And this is where the, we use this technique where we do contrast uh, echo. Um, again, we instrument one we think is good before we commit to the alcohol, because you cannot take it back once you give alcohol. We want to test it. And so we'll instrument one we think is good. Um, and then we'll do this technique with the contrast echo. And I'll, I'll show you uh, an example of that. Here's another patient, again, with an array of septals, just showing you the range of anatomy. It's all different. Everybody's different. Um, and in this particular patient, we picked one. And this is the imaging. So you saw the echo before. Uh, this is the part of the septum that I want to see light up. And you can see how it's nice and bright white. This is the mitral, the anterior leaflet, the mitral valve. This is where it's contacting the thick septum. And that's where the obstruction is. So if when I inject the contrast echo bubbles down the septal and it's lighting up right here, I'm in the right spot. If it's lighting up down here, I'm not in the right spot. If it's lighting up in the right ventricle, I'm not in the right spot. So this tells me, and I've had patients where we brought them to the cath lab, we've instrumented their septals and we said, uh-uh, alcohol is not going to help you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to abort the procedure because there's no sense in doing it if it's not going to help them. But when I see this, I get a great result. The, the last case I wanted to show was also one John and I saw, yeah, I young lady. I, oh, I can sorry, about, go ahead. I'll present her. Yes. Yeah, so, oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, so this is an interesting woman. She's she's only fifty, um, and uh, history of uh, paroxysmal AFib, but uh, HCM um, uh, known about for a long time, and really um, uh, failing medical management, and really really symptomatic. Um, she's a smoker um and uh has a history of the icd uh in place her uh, septum is about 1.8 almost two centimeters and amazingly high gradients uh, with severe obstruction as you see there and so uh she was from southwest virginia um you know tobacco country um and but everything was lining up saying this is going to be a pretty straightforward situation for a, a septal myectomy and um, yep, Mike's got, I mean, <laughs> she's, uh, uh, she, she, she's got a lot going on there. She's almost got no cavity. She's got, in addition to, you know, basal hypertrophy, she's got a lot of kind of concentric hypertrophy, but there's enough basal hypertrophy that I think we can, uh, I think we can help someone like that. So this is her coronary anatomy and, and this is unusual anatomy because she has a single giant septal perforator, which at first appearance, you say, well, we can't use that um, because it's going to take out her entire septum. That's going to do too much damage. But actually, if you look at this, the, it's sub branches. So here's the septal perforator, and then there's branches off that. And so when, when John's going to explain why we thought septal ablation might be an option for her. I looked at this and said, you know, we actually could get into one of these sub branches and treat just one or two of these and not take out the whole septal array and maybe get her through this procedure if, if that was going to be the right thing for her. So and, um, you want to talk and, about your, yeah, uh, it, you know, so, so here again for, you know, I, I, my, my life, I'm, I'm blessed in working at UVA with these folks because, you know, Mike gave kudos earlier, but, uh, there's no cath cardiologist in this world who is as skilled as Mike Rigas, I just got to say. And, <laughs> and so it really, when I see these patients, knowing that there's that backstop is, uh, is just so, so great. So she came to clinic and um, um, she basically came to clinic in a wheelchair on oxygen um, with, uh, she, we sent her for, for pulmonary function studies 
and uh, severe COPD due, due to her cigarette and active ongoing cigarette use. Um, as I said, home oxygen, um, really mostly sedentary and unfortunately uh, not uh, great social support for post-operative recovery from heart surgery. And so went back and looked at the cath uh, with Mike and, and he surmised what he just went over with you. And we said, you know, okay, uh, the, 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 in the greater scheme of things and risk benefit ratio, it seems like the way to go uh, would be, even though we thought initially she might be better for myectomy, uh, maybe she'd be better served with uh, septal ablation. And so that's what we did. We, uh, and again, just to show you the result we got with her, this was her baseline, again, gradient, very high at rest. And this is what it was after the septal ablation. Again, some residual gradient. Um, I wish I could show you that it was all gone. And, and we have plenty of patients I can show you where it completely goes away. But there's some, but you can see it's, it's markedly better than what she started with. And the, the hope is she will be symptomatically improved with this. So we actually got a very nice result um, considering that you saw how thick that heart muscle was. Um, and then just the final word I wanted to say is that there are quality benchmarks that any center of excellence should be holding to both for myectomy and for septal ablation. And there's, we track these and, and, and watch these and what is our mortality, our complication rate, what's our need for pacemaker. And you can see, you know, what these ought to be considered. These are the benchmarks and, and we should be doing at least as good, if not better, uh, with all of these parameters and certainly any center you go to, you should ask these questions. You know, what is your rate of repeat procedure? What is your result with, uh, with reduction of gradient? And what is your pacemaker rate? Those are very important questions to ask. Um, and so that's, um, that's all John and I had. Um, what do you mean that's all? <laughs> well, that's all that I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah, um, you know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is why Center of Excellence Care matters. You just had kind of a sneak peek into case conference, how these cases are discussed, why there's these different uh, skill sets in the room to help assess. And it's critically important that you have this high volume experience to ensure that you're getting the right care. You brought up a couple of really great points, one of which I would rather, um, I'd rather not have to say, but your smoker, uh, that case, there was a, I will de-identify this as best as possible. There was a, a, a woman who needed a myectomy, went to a mid-range volume upper, uh, surgeon uh, because she couldn't get out of state for insurance reasons, and this is what she could get to. Promised that she'd stop smoking a month ahead of the surgery. Smoked outside the hospital going into surgery. She never left the hospital because she couldn't get off the ventilator. And she died a month after her surgery. If you are a smoker with HCM, I don't know what words I can use to encourage you to stop, but maybe one of our faculty here tonight can explain what smoking does to the heart and the heart rate and how this is not good for HCM. Who wants to take the smoking question? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had the words uh, to be able to convince people to stop. And, um, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, someone else should comment on kind of the specific effects of smoking on HCM. You know, I can relate to it in terms of what it means to just, you know, post-op recovery and, and, and pulmonary risk and the risk for not getting off the ventilator and things like that. Um, and, and it just, um, it's just the worst thing ever. So nicotine makes your heart race faster. It makes your heart contract harder while you're taking medications for HCM to slow your heart rate and help your heart relax you're working against yourself is the simplest way I can put it. Does my faculty agree with this assessment? Yeah, completely. And, and yeah. I mean, and that, you know, that goes for a lot of heart conditions we operate on, right? You know, coronary disease and valvular disease and, 
you know, faster heart rates and heart muscle that has to work harder. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, it's not good. And, um, but it's, uh, you know, um, it's a tough habit, right? I mean, you know, I, I grew up in a family that smoked a lot and, As uh, did I. you know, it's, it's a tough problem. We are not shaming. We are not trying to make you feel bad about your life choice. We are just simply here to say it's really bad for your HCM heart to also have to contend with being a smoker. So do the best for yourself and use all of the resources possible to quit or at least cut way back. It's the best you can do. Um, so somebody's asking a question about how much experience does the UVA team have with myectomy now? And how did you get your experience? And do you have any mentors in larger volume programs? Um, so, I, I mean, all I can say, I mean, I've, I've been at UVA for basically 30, 25, going on 30 years now. And, um, you know, I had a mentor here. And like a lot of these technical things, you learn from your mentor and you go to other uh, higher volume centers and you learn from them and then you carry that back. And, and now our job is to mentor the other folks here. So, um, you know, I'll be the first to say we do, you know, we don't do as many as some higher volume centers in terms of myectomies. Um, but we do, uh, we do a, a fair number to be, yeah. So so a thing happened today uh, out west, a gentleman wants to go to his local hospital for a myectomy and wanted to get the HCMA's opinion on that. I said, well, how many surgeons has this, how many surgeries has this individual done and where were they trained? So he called and the PA or the assistant to the surgeon responded with 30 or 40, I think. And he called me back and said 30 or 40, I think. And I called them back and I said, I don't think so. Because I don't know who any of you are. And I've looked at your CV and I looked at where you're trained at. I don't think so. To which the PA responded, well, we do some. So what should patients be careful of when asking about the volume and the experience of a surgeon or somebody performing alcohol septal ablation on them? Should they go with round numbers or should they get specific data on experience? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think specific data is good. Uh, like a lot of things, a lot of technical things, there are some people, um, how do I want to relate this to, whether it being a musician or whether it being an athlete, when it comes to things like septal myectomy, there are folks who can probably, after seeing a few, being taught a few and doing five or 10, are quite expert. And there are folks who may have done 200 and are still not quite expert. So again, I think it's, you know, you don't want someone who's on the learning curve, but it's hard to find something, you know, um, if, if you want to go the whole kind of great to excellent sort of thing, uh, no one's done 10,000 myectomies, you know, so. Yeah, I think we're prob the, probably the largest producer in the United States is probably approaching the 3000 mark over career. Right. Um, and there's like one or two people up there. But they started somewhere at some they point. They started somewhere. They certainly started <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. That 3000, they did 30. Yep, that they did. Um, and the anatomies in HCM, whether they be appropriate for alcohol septal ablation or they'd be appropriate for myectomy. Have you ever seen two hearts that were exactly the same? No. No, it's, it's, I mean, the, the variation that you see in everything, in all these things is, is striking. That's what, again, why these are really hard decisions that we have to make. And it takes a lot of thought and consideration. And so the more you see the better, right? Because then you, you, you will have seen a bunch of these previously and you kind of have a sense of how they're going to do, but to, to kind of get back to one of your earlier points, I, I think rather than the individual surgeon or interventional cardiologist, I would have the patient ask, do, does, do they have a center for, for HCM? Or, you know, is, is the whole structure in place? I mean, again, like if my patient needs a pacemaker, I need Pam Mason to, to do that. I, I may ask Pam to do that pre-alcohol septal ablation, right? I want to ask Chris Kramer to help me understand the imaging 
I'm looking at when I'm confused by something, right? Uh, and I'm going to have John weigh in on. So it's it's all these pieces. You need all the components, and to it's not dependent on one physician who may or may not be good. You need the whole team, and you need the whole program. So it's more important that they have a program than a high volume single operator, in my opinion. Excellent, excellent point. We do have one more question. And after the conclusion of this question, I will stop streaming on Facebook and I will stop recording so that anybody who wishes to ask a question that is not recorded for posterity can be asked in somewhat privacy. Um, and the way this question is worded, I understand that it's kind of an unanswerable, but I'll let you guys attack it. How do you minimize the occurrence of a left bundle branch block after a myectomy? Well, um, you know, minimizing it, you know, it's challenging because, you know, we can't see the conduction system with our eyeballs. Um, we know where it is. Uh, we know the bulk of the septum we need to take out. We know the area we need to avoid. And if we end up with, um, you know, a conduction abnormality or a bundle, um, but we still have nodal conduction and can avoid a pacemaker, uh, that's a win. Um, and so that, you know, can be really challenging sometimes. Uh, we didn't get into all the variants and the other things that we do at the time of septal myectomy. There's, you know, we look at the papillary muscles, we look at the chordal attachments, the anterior leaflet, and uh, there are other things we can do. Um, again, one of the main things is, is to really reduce the systolic anterior motion and to really enhance closure of the, of the mitral valve. Um, and so, uh, it's not uncommon to, you know, leave a bit of a gradient, but um, we try to avoid that. Again, it, it, it can be a judgment. And, and um, in a younger person, we really want to do everything we can to avoid a pacemaker. Uh, that's for sure. Fantastic answer. Thank you. Facebook, we are checking out. Thank you for joining us tonight. You can watch a rebroadcast on YouTube at any time or here on Facebook. Thank you for joining us.